Good afternoon and welcome to the joint meeting of the Cabinet, Education, Skills and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. My name is Alison and I am the Scrutiny Officer for this meeting. Just to make you all aware, today's meeting will be recorded. Can I also welcome members of the public and press to today's meeting. Can I kindly ask that you observe the meeting only and do not speak or participate. The first item on today's agenda is to appoint a chairperson and vice chairperson. Can I please have a proposal for a chair? I'd like to propose Councillor Rebecca Phillips for chair, please. Thank you, Councillor Rogers. Can I please have a second? I second that. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Can members please indicate if they wish to abstain from the vote? If members do not indicate to the contrary, then I would take it that this decision is supported. Thank you, Councillor Rebecca Phillips. You can now take the chair. Diolch Alson, a croeso i bawb i'r cyfarfod pwysig yma. Thank you, Alson, and welcome all to this important meeting. I would like to propose Councillor Phil Rogers as vice chair. Could I please have a seconder? I'll second that. Can members please indicate if they wish to abstain? I can see no abstentions, Chair. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary, then I will take it that this decision is supported. I can see no indications to the contrary, Chair. Can I please invite Councillor Phil Rogers to take the Vice Chair position? Diolch. Agenda item two, chairs announcements. Can I please remind members of the logistics of today's meeting? We will firstly take the joint meeting of Cabinet, Education, Skills and Wellbeing Scrutiny, where the Strategic School Improvement Programme will be discussed. Following the conclusion of the Scrutiny Committee, the Cabinet will meet to take the decision. If attending virtually, you will have received a separate invitation for the Cabinet meeting. In addition, can I refer you to the protocols for hybrid meetings, which has previously been circulated? Please can you ensure that your phones are switched to silent for the duration of the meeting and that your microphones are muted when not speaking? If members wish to speak or ask a question, please could you raise electronic hands or physical hand if you're in the council chamber? Also, those in the chamber, please use your microphone when speaking. Agenda item three, declarations of interest. I will now invite the Head of Legal, Craig Griffiths, to provide advice in relation to this item. Diolch, Craig. Diolch, Chair. There are a few interests that I need to take members through today before we progress, but before I do so, I will provide some general advice to all members. As you will know, when arriving at decisions relating to any of the Council's business, you must do so with an open mind and consider all the information before you objectively, having due regard to the advice your Council's officers provide. During the decision-making process, you must act fairly and in the public interest. You are required to make your decisions on the basis of the facts in front of you and not to have made up your mind in advance of today's meeting. If you consider that you have come to a settled view or decision in respect of this matter prior to this meeting and are unable or unwilling to take into account any other representations or advice you have received, you will in all likelihood have been seen to predetermine this matter. If you have predetermined this matter, you will be unable to take any further part in this decision and will be unlikely to be able to participate if any further decisions fall due to be made. The proposal which falls to be considered today is a new and fresh decision that members must make. So the fact that you may have voted in a particular way at a previous meeting will not amount to predetermination, provided you retain a genuinely open mind in respect of this meeting. You are also entitled to hold a preliminary view about a particular matter in advance of the meeting. We refer to this as predisposition, but you must keep a genuinely open mind and be prepared to consider the merits of all arguments and points that will be made today. Predetermination, on the other hand, as I've indicated earlier, would mean you have clearly decided on a course of action in advance of today's meeting. 
Predetermination can not only invalidate a decision, it can lead to proceedings being brought against the Council, and it may also be seen to amount to a breach of the Member's Code of Conduct. To make you aware, there are two different types of predetermination you must consider. Actual predetermination, and this is when a person has closed their mind to all other considerations and already have their view, or apparent predetermination. This is where a fair-minded and well-informed observer looking objectively at all of the circumstances feels that there is a real risk that one or more of the decision makers has refused even to consider a relevant argument or would refuse to consider a new argument. It is this perhaps element of apparent determination that you must give great thought to. It should be noted that the determination here is for one for members to decide. If a challenge was brought as to a decision maker having predetermined, it would be for that member to justify and provide evidence that they were not predetermined. For the sake of clarity, I would add that manifesto commitments and policy statements which are consistent with the preparedness to consider and weigh relevant factors when reaching the final decision are predisposition, not predetermination. In addition, previously expressed views on matters which arise for decision in the ordinary run of events are routine. You must just obtain an, an open mind for this particular decision. Accordingly, if there are any members who wish to declare predetermination, now would be the opportunity in which to do so. And I see no indications on that front. So I now move on to general interest. I'll try and take these out on block so we can deal with them as quickly as possible. But are there any members who have any close personal associates who have attended the said schools which are subject to today's report or anyone perhaps who works at the said schools? If so, could they please raise their hands? Councillor Jenkins, I'll come to you in a separate interest just in a moment. Councillor Clement Williams, please. Um, yeah, it's only now because you've asked. Um, I now have a, a great niece going to Rathwen. I'm, I'm not this, predetermined though. No, the Standards Committee in this case have already granted uh, dispensations in that regard to members who may have family members that they can speak and, and vote on matters. Whether you feel that is personal or prejudicial, that would be for determination for you to make. But the Standards Committee will have granted a dispensation in this regard to cover it. So I see I, I'm, sure, I'm, I, I'm sure I must have checked it out before, but it's been so long. I just yes. needed to clarify. Thank you. Um, no it's problem. personal. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask, therefore, if any members are school governors of any schools within the county borough? If so, please, could you raise your hands and keep them raised while we just make a note of these? I would confirm the Standards Committee has granted you a dispensation to speak and vote on these matters. OK, thank you, members. Please go with your hands. Uh, and finally, Councillor Jenkins, I believe you have an interest to declare over and above what we've just mentioned. Thank you, Craig. Yes, my declaration, I'm a school governor, both within the county and um, I'm a governor at Athlone Primary School. The Standards Committee have granted me a dispensation to speak and vote. But given it is one of the schools in question, on seeking advice my do and my dual role, I will only be exercising my dispensation to speak on this item. Thank you, Councillor Jenkins. And finally, are there any other interest over and above what we've just mentioned for members to declare today? I see none. So thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Craig Dial. Agenda item four, pre-decision scrutiny. Before we go any further, I know that this issue is one that we'll be discussing today is very emotive and it will have a big impact on the communities in the Swansea Valley. That being said, I expect those making contributions to be respectful and not make any personal attacks on other members or officers. I will be giving all members a chance to get their views and questions across. 
As previously advised, I will be stopping speakers after five minutes and asking you to round up your contributions. Also, remember that this is a scrutiny meeting and that it could be kept non-political. I would suggest the recorded vote will take place and I will be proposing this later on in the meeting. Andrew Thomas, as a director, would you like to give a brief overview of the report before members go into questions? Diolch. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't intend to give a, um, an overview of the report because it's, it's it's lengthy and members will have read it, but I do. I would just like to sort of say a few, a few words just in terms of context, really, uh, and where we are in the process. <clears throat> this is a three-stage process, essentially. Last November, our officers went to members and asked them for permission to consult on the proposal, which obviously we we did that. We did that. We did that between um, the end of November and the beginning of February. Uh, a consultation report has been prepared. The responses are available to everybody uh, in the room and, and obviously the officers uh, response to those consultation comments. So members today, the cabinet that is, um, not scrutiny, um, have one of three decisions to take essentially. The first decision is to um, move ahead with the proposal as it currently stands. Um, the second decision that they could take is that they, they make a slight amendment to the current proposal, which is the, obviously the officer recommendation. Now, when I talk about a slight amendment, I'm talking about maybe the implementation date. It certainly wouldn't involve um, there are three schools uh, captured at the moment within this proposal. We certainly couldn't drop one school and move ahead with two. That would be a significant change and re would require a new um, statutory proposal. So it's a it's a minor tweak. And of course, the third option that uh, Cabinet will have later on today will be to stop this process and um, you know rethink the whole um, delivery of education in the Swansea Valley. If, if members do propose that we go ahead, we will enter the period 28 days of statutory objections. People will be asked to formally comment, object, that is. Uh, we would remind people that if they've commented during the consultation phase, if we get to this stage, that they would still need to um, submit their um, their objections during the 28 day period for those for those responses to be considered by officers. If we get that far, officers will prepare a response report to those objections and we will be back before members probably sometime late June, early July. But that's the process, uh, Chair. So now happy to take any questions. Thank you, Diochenwaar Andrew. As decided in pre-scrutiny, we will take questions in section with members already indicated going first. And we will start with the consultation process and our first speaker, Councillor Ken Phillips, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is on page 33, a potential risk is identified as resistance to change leading to a lack of pupil, parent and staff support. Given that the consultation has shown such strong opposition among residents and stakeholders who are actually based in the Swansea Valley area, those who should presumably have the greatest understanding of the local issues. What changes or amendments are being made or proposed to the plans to address their concerns, to show that we're listening and try to mitigate that risk by creating some buy-in? Yeah. Um thank you for that question. Th those risks are included in the report because um, I think it's incumbent upon officers to make sure that members have all the information they possibly can um, before they make any decision, uh, as I outlined earlier. The, um, the, the there, we're not at a stage where we can mitigate, but what we what we do have is experience of introducing school reorganisation proposals uh, across the county over probably the best part of a decade now. And we do know that all the fears that parents, the community, pupils have, we work hard post implementation uh, of the decision to make sure that those fears are allayed, any concerns that they have. We make sure that the transition into any new arrangement, whether that be a, a single school or, or, or whatever the arrangement is, the new arrangement is managed sensitively. We all, all, always involve the trade unions. Um, one thing I can tell you is we've probably done this 35, 40 times now in, in Neath Talbot over the last 12, 13 years. And to date, we haven't made one compulsory redundancy because we treat our staff with respect. We involve our trade unions. 
So there's an awful lot of work done post-implementation or post-decision, if you like, to allay those fears. But I think it's just right and proper that we included in the report, Councillor Phillips, so that um, we're not misleading members in any way. It is, I understand, disruptive. Um, people have you know, significant feelings around these sorts of proposals. So we included in the report as a potential risk um, so that members are fully informed. Thank you, Andrew. Councillor Phillips, are you happy with that? Yes, thank you for that answer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Diolch. Moving on to Councillor Anthony Richards, please. Uh, Diolch and Fawr, uh, uh, can I firstly thank the Rainbow Coalition, firstly, on committing to reviewing this proposal. Uh, the majority of the community are grateful uh, to have had this opportunity uh, to reconsult. Uh, but of course, we had to reconsult anyway, as the decision by the High Court decided that the Council had failed to uh, assess the impact on the Welsh medium schools and had therefore acted unlawfully. Uh, we can all appreciate that this is a very emotive subject with very strong feelings, strong feelings on all on sides. All. And I respectfully understand that. But what I will say is whatever our views are, I hope that we can all agree that the desire should be for good educational standards, which it's important to note that our current schools do have. And also for the community, so the pupils, the parents, the residents, the staff, the governors, to have a fair discussion based on honest facts. We need a proposal that is grown from the community and really not a proposal that is being imposed on our communities and many people do feel that. We only have to, we only have to ask ourselves from the consultation, how much support was there for this proposal? The whole purpose of any consultation is of course to provide as much information as possible for the public to understand and to respond. And whilst thoroughly reading the documentation, I have found that the document is often um, unbalanced and biased, and therefore I am really struggling at the moment to support the proposal with the current information to hand without that specific information being answered. Now, it does, in my opinion, question how serious the officers have taken the information from the community uh, on this consultation, as there are a number of questions that are still unanswered. Now, I am prepared to keep an open mind and I will be voting based on the answers and the assurances from the officers that they can give today. Now, it seems absolutely clear to me that from the consultation report that there is very little support for the new school uh, in our communities that it is meant to serve. It does highlight some positive comments does highlight some positive comments. However, the overwhelming majority have not provided any support to this proposal. I would add that the governing bodies of the three schools, Pontadawe Town Council, Killabebit Community Council, the residents of the Swansea Valley have rejected this proposal of 816 responses, 576 were against the new school. I think, you know, we've nearly had as, as much responses to this as what we had for the whole of the uh, council uh, budget of across the whole of Neath for Talbot. So the council's own public participation strategy emphasizes the importance of local democracy and the need to listen and work with communities to face new challenges together. We need to work with the community, not against them in doing so. The public's opinion needs to be heard and respected. Therefore, how much engagement did the officers have with the community about this proposal? What response have residents or people had from the officers to alleviate their concerns or fears? And if so, what percentage have now changed their mind due to those responses from officers? Diochen Vaur, and I have got a further question, Chair. Thank you, Diochen. Just to remind members, these are questions and uh, not speeches at this point. Thank you very much, Councillor Richards. Um, officers, please. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor Richards. Um, you 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 asked about the the responses, but you answered your own question there, didn't you? Because you had the response numbers there. Um, in terms of who we engaged with, we held 13 different meetings, face-to-face -face meetings that ranged from people, um, parents in the school, governors, staff, pupils, very important. Uh, and we also held one face-to-face -face public meeting and an online meeting as well. So, you know, I think I, I think I'm not sure what more engagement we could have done there. Um, that 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 was quite extensive over a. a a period of time during the consultation. You, you will also be aware that every single response that came in has been collated and presented to members for you to read your, for yourselves. So you're not just taking the officer's view of those of those questions. You, you've got them there for, for yourself. Um, and the consultation report has, has taken the, the range of comments that have been made and responded to them with facts and with evidence where we're able to provide it. Um, what, what was your, in terms of people changing their mind, I don't know because I, I don't know who decided what in the first place. I don't know who made comments the first time around. We don't record names as such. We record um, the comments that are made and those are the comments that have gone through. They're anonymized so that everyone is, is protected and can say what they want to say. So in terms of who's changed their mind, I'm sorry, I've got no idea. All I do know is that we have never had um, as many responses in support of a proposal as we've had to this one. Admittedly, there's still not as many as opposed and we can see, you can see the numbers for yourself, but that was that was new for us and there was a substantial number who were in support of the proposal. Does that answer your question? Is that, is that OK? Yeah, Diolch and Bawr. Um, my further question is, what is the, and I don't mind who answers this, the education officers, chief executive, legal officer, cabinet, whoever wants to answer, what is your professional view? Because we're talking about the consultation here. What is your professional view on the fact that, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to make this political, but that a political party locally interfered with a democratic process by leafleting local houses with misleading information about this proposal? What has been the council's response to this? And do you believe that this has undermined the consultation? Do you come out? Yeah, thanks, uh, Councillor Richards. Rihanna just referred to the um, public meetings that we had. I attended six of them, no, seven of them face to face. Um, th this um, leaflet drop that um, you referred to was mentioned in, in those meetings, and I was very clear with everybody who raised it. Um, those are political matters. They're nothing to do with officers. Um, I told everybody who asked that um, this is a process, as I described earlier. The consultation responses would get a professional um, response within the consultation report, which is what members have have in front of them today, so that they're fully informed when they make the decision. The political aspects of this have nothing to do with officers whatsoever. Yeah, thank you. Do what members have any further questions on the consultation process, please? No, I don't see any, so we'll move on to Oh, sorry. Sorry, Councillor Reynolds. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask officers, what would be the normal expectation in a consultation uh, exercise in terms of where there is a proposal? Would the normal expectation be that you would get more people against a proposal than for it? Or would it be that you would get an equal number or, you know, how would how would you judge that? Thank you. Yeah, in in I think every case where we've got a school reorganisation, there are always more people um, against the proposal than for. I think sometimes people confuse the um, purpose of consultation. The purpose of consultation is to um, shape, help shape and understand whether what officers are taking forward is, is the best way to deliver education in an area. Um, it's not an exercise of trying to win hearts and minds. It's an exercise of making sure that you do enough public consultation so people understand what it is we're proposing um, and then they come back with comments so that as officers and professionals, we it helps us shape the proposal. Clearly, if we if we've missed something or um, if we weren't aware of something in, in a locale, then it might lead us to change our mind. But we're not looking for. Um, public approval on it because you don't get public approval on a school reorganisation proposal. It's just just doesn't happen. Um, so it's very much about shaping the proposal 
and making sure that we've thought of everything when we give advice to to the cabinet uh, at the appropriate time. And so, yeah, the expectation is always more people um, are against it because very often the, the majority of people who afford it don't say anything anyway. So um, that, that's our experience. Thank you. Councillor Carol Clement Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I'm going to ask this question now because Councillor Richards has alluded to um, the Labour Party in Pontedowie putting out incorrect information. I want for the record to ask um, Andrew, the Director of Education, um, they are um, MS, the opposition to us is MS, has published an article to say that the money can be moved into upgrading the existing schools instead of used for the school that this proposal is um, suggesting. Can I confirm, is that information correct or not? Because she has published that and said that that is the case. Thank you. Sorry, firstly, can I just come in with Craig here? Because I, I personally don't recall Councillor Richard mentioning the Labour Party. No, he said I, I, the I didn't low, hear any terms, obviously, party. with regard... If I could just, I, I didn't hear any terms of that reference within any political groups in that sense. So obviously, I think that can be noted. I think just okay. members need to be very cautious here about you moving into territory, obviously, which takes you outside of the realms of what we're looking at here. You should be concentrating on the information that is ultimately before you and not issues perhaps that have gone on within the community or what comments have been made outside of these particular processes. So if I can okay. just bring members back to the content of the report and the discussions being had here today as we move forward, Chair. OK, so coming back to my question, is the fact that this money can be moved, the money that has been earmarked for the schools, can it be spent to upgrade the existing schools instead? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think this is an important point of clarity, which I assumed was going to be picked up today. The If the proposal that um, we've consulted on doesn't go ahead, the Welsh Government funding of about £14.7 million, Welsh Government have confirmed this, is ring-fenced, so we don't we don't lose it in um, Neath Talbot, it's ring-fenced for school reorganisation proposals in Neath Talbot, not the Swansea Valley, in Neath Talbot, quite clearly Swansea Valley is in Neath Talbot, um, so you know it's an option. What you have to, what we would have to do then is put forward another um, capital funding application to Welsh Government. We would have to have to satisfy their five case business model, which is their requirements in terms of giving local authorities funding for this sort of project. So the money wouldn't be lost to Neath Patol, but but it certainly it isn't within the gift of um, members in Neath Patol, but they can just spend the money on projects that they wish to. We would have to ask for the. Uh, we have to reapply for funding uh, on the basis of a satisfactory capital funding application. So I think that's the that's the that's the top and tail of it, really. Okay, thank you for that. Do we have further questions on the consultation process, please? Thank Should you, you Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Thomas, if if uh, at the end of the day, this proposal did not go forward. Um, how would that affect timescales for anything else that you wanted to um, progress with uh, educationally, new schools, blah, 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 bearing in mind that we are um, in a period of um, not being short of officers, but of officers having their time fully allocated would it make any difference? I suppose my answer to that is it, it depends on... Uh, if, if this proposal doesn't progress today, um, quite quite simply, what will happen to Athrena Thangiuk? The answer is nothing. They will not close quite clearly, and they will continue as is. There'll be no capital application for funding for those two schools. Um, they will be continued to be maintained and upgraded, through the resources that local authority in East Talbot has at its disposal, like every other school, so there'd be no significant uh, improvement whatsoever. Godric Greg, of course, is in a is in a different position. We have to do something for Godric Greg. So if it doesn't progress today, we as officers will need to um, give give members advice uh, in due course. Now that won't be that won't be a quick process. 
Um, but we would have to do that because of the, you know, because of the fact the children and the families, you know, in, in, in terms of the circumstances they find themselves within. Uh, but of course, we we do have a ban C, which has been approved by members in terms of the new uh, replacement Langatug, uh, St. Joseph's Comp uh, Secondary School and Tawin Primary. We've also, you know, the great news we had a few weeks ago was we've been, we've secured 15 million pounds of the funding from Welsh Government to replace uh, Ross Avon. Um, and all of those schemes, there is no work whatsoever being done on those uh, other than the, the application we put together for Rose Avon, but that was very high level. Uh, the detail now, uh, none of that work has been done. So, as you say, there's only so much officer capacity. We have to get on with um, starting to think about replacing Tlangatuk and St. Joe's because of Antawin business continuity failure issues and risks. And those are those are significant risks to the local authority. Um, so the replacement or, or whatever we do in terms of uh, delivering education for God Gray will be in that mix. It won't be the priority. It'll be one of a number of priorities. Um, but undoubtedly, you know, it's 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 difficult because of all the other pressing priorities. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, moving on to community impact, and I'd like to call Councillor Timbo when, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, this is more statement rather than uh, a question. Um, Twelve years ago, we lost two of our schools uh, in the Palena Valley from Mount Pontle then. Um, both of them had excellent reports and all the children were moved to schools with fair reports, which we didn't think was fair at the time. Um, not only that, the impact it has on the villages, we lost the shop. Post office went down to part-time post office half day. Um, children not out playing as much as what they used to be and socialising with each other. Um, basically what I'm trying to say, you know, a lot of this is new to new members and yourselves, but before anybody makes a vote on this, just think of the impact on the villages, because it does leave a bit of taste at the end of it. And, you know, not all villages can come back from it. We were lucky we did. But like I said, not a lot of villages will come back out of this if they've got nothing at all in the villages. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Diolch and Vaur. Councillor Ken Phillips, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've got several specific questions on this area. I'm just going to uh, roll them all in into one, if that's OK. Uh, starting off on page 18, the report says many community activities and events are not reliant on the schools and then that there should be no ad no adverse effect, which doesn't quite up many is not the same as all. What about those that are reliant on the schools and or those that rely on school gate personal contacts within the communities and the consequences for community cohesion of closing the schools? What consideration has been made about that? Um, then on page 30, uh, it states that the proposal would positively impact on school on social cohesion. And then that the proposed the proposal contributes to the well-being objective of ensuring all communities are thriving and sustainable. On that one, I'll admit um, that seems a slightly odd conclusion to me. It, um, how does removing schools deeply embedded within three of our smaller valleys communities positively impact on the cohesion of those three communities and make them more thriving and sustainable? Um, on page 65, it states that the deciding factor in determining school organisation proposals should be one of securing the best educational offer for children. Clearly, that's an important consideration and uh, I don't think anybody would argue with that. But the school organisation code also says schools are major public and community assets. It is important that their future is considered not just from an educational perspective, but across the full range of a local authority's responsibilities. In other words, as a local authority, it seems to me that we should be considering decisions based like this, like this, uh, based on wider factors than purely education alone. How has that been taken into account during this process? Um, and finally, on a slightly different note, on page 17, with regard to the playing fields at Park Anisteru, 
it, st it states that there would be no loss of leisure amenities to the community. Is it anticipated that there would be changes in public access to the playing fields? Would control of access and use of the fields be handed over to the new school, as uh, apparently happened with Bay Baglan? So uh, those are my questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Officers, please. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to try and catch it all that. I didn't write it down as you were talking. Right. First of all, you were talking about, I think, the um, the community use of the schools and, and some of those questions that you've asked actually tie in together anyway. As part of this process, um, we are obliged and, and we would anyway to undertake a community impact assessment, which was undertaken and which was included as part of the consultation documentation. Now, that concluded um, that the community use of the three or the the three schools as were um, and, and the two schools and the current school that's in the temporary building, that there was very, very little community use at all. And if I can clarify that, and I think that would be was in the community impact assessment, but to clarify that, the use that is being made to the schools is mainly by parents. So you'll have things like parent and toddler groups going on or family groups. Now, it, it those things are going on despite the um the layout and the and the, the situation of the schools where they are now a new school with all the additional facilities and as part of the grant funding we are obliged now to build schools that have community access and have properly thought out community access so for example um a community room that can be accessed by the community without having to go through the school um and you know interfere in any way with the school activities that is of benefit to a community and that has got to be better than what is currently being used so in terms of um, enhancing the community offer, we believe, officers firmly believe, that a new school with, with additional community facilities is of benefit to those communities, not, not, not um, of detriment. So that, that is why that's, um, that impact assessment explains that, you know, community cohesion and, and, and that type of thing. Um, yeah, just stepping, because I forgot. Uh, just in terms of the Bay and Fields, Councillor Phillips, um, I think members might have been provided with um, um, a proposed layout and it is a proposed layout because obviously um, the work on the school stopped um, when the um, the outcome of the, the court case was known. Um, but it does demonstrate that there's uh, sufficient land there to build the school and maintain the same number of playing fields. And just to confirm that those playing fields do meet the various governing body standards in terms of competitive sport, whether that be football or rugby. Um, and you, you mentioned public access to it. Um, there is a sports association <coughs> which are responsible for the playing fields uh, at Park and Esteru, and there's no proposal to change that arrangement. In fact, when we did the community impact assessment, the, the gentleman who heads that up um, was, was interviewed by one of our officers, Paul Hinder, and he confirmed that our proposals wouldn't hinder the uh, community access. And um, the, as long as we improve the drainage on on the on some of the pitches then there would be no detrimental impact to community in community use and there certainly wouldn't be any change to the fact that the sports association manages that um facility so there'd, there'd be no detriment there when it comes to phillips thank you councillor phillips are you happy that your questions have been answered um uh, yeah thank you for the for the answer on the uh, uh playing fields issue on the other issue, I think uh, it's it's worth reiterating the point that while the that the suggestion is that it improves community cohesion, um, it's not within the same communities. It's not within the three valleys communities currently served by the school, and the uh, we do have a duty to uh, of ensuring all communities and thrive are thriving and sustainable. And I think it's worth reiterating that point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Phillips. Uh, your comments have been noted. Councillor Goldup John, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone, so far. So um, I've got a few questions, if that's OK, and I'll just list them and then we can go that way. I think it's easier. Um, just with regards to the proposal itself, um, how would that work with the existing LDP, noting that it is outside the settlement boundary and it is inside a safeguarding mineral zone area and close to a floodplain, if not a floodplain. Um, in addition to that, um, Planning Policy Wales outlines sustainable development and placemaking charters. 
and the point of the placemaking charter one point says location having housing employment leisure and other facilities are provided to help are planned to help reduce the need for private car travel note in those two points how does moving two schools four miles down the valley to a place that is in essence outside the settlement boundary in actually quite a tricky location how does that promote sustainable development um, and to add to that point how does it check against the other place making charter elements of ppw and then just second to that because it's kind of leading point on to what councillor phillips said earlier um in the business case business case proposal and um, its guidance that I saw online, it wasn't the business case, I haven't seen that. But in the business case guidance, it says that um, there is an aspiration for all facilities to receive investment and commit to um, assets, assets being available for community use. So note in that, um, a note in point 76 in the report where it says that many community based activities and events are not reliant on schools, therefore the school should uh, be no adverse effect on community activities or events if schools are closed. I'm struggling to understand how those two points align because one saying it doesn't matter that the school will close because events aren't reliant on the school. But then in the business case guidance, it says that community events should happen in co community centres. So can can you just provide me a little bit of guidance on that and just enlighten me a bit more because I'm a bit confused. Thank you. I'll try and answer the latter one while Nick gathers her thoughts around the, your planning questions because I'll admit I'm no expert on planning. So um, just, it's a fact there is very little community use of the three existing schools. So you know that's not a that's not a good thing, but that, that that's a fact. Um, but Welsh government, when they ask us to design new schools and, and therefore go forward with proposals, they they recognise the importance of community use of school facilities. Uh, years ago, and I'm going back quite some time, schools would typically be, you know, open half past eight till half past three, 39 weeks a year, Monday to Friday. And and obviously, as a community resource, uh, that's not an effective use of, of community uh, resource. So they ask us to, to build into our thinking when we come up with these proposals, how we could offer facilities to attract the community into them to make sure that we've got community development and pro proper community use. So if the new school went ahead, that's what we would do. We would um, focus on making sure that those facilities were used more often. They are certainly open access in terms of um, there's, there's no restrictions on anybody using them. It have to be done on a planned basis in terms of bookings and, you know, no doubt any any head teacher with governing body would want to charge the community as well because they'd want to make some money. Um, but so, so that's the that's the tension, if you like. It's a fact that there's very little community use at the moment. But going forward, if we developed a new school and spent, I don't know, probably the thick end of £30 million um, on this development, there's an expectation, quite rightly, from Welsh Government that we've thought about how we would get the community to use that asset more often to the for the benefit of lots of different things, health and well-being obviously being a very important one. But, you, yeah, of course. Um, I, I take that on board and I really appreciate that because that's provided me a lot of clarity, but I think that's just generated a follow up point of if, for instance, Godric Ride does go down to Ponte Dawe, it's four miles away. So how are people in Godric Ride then going to be enthused to use a school four miles away when they weren't already enthused to use Godric Ride School as a community centre, if that's the case? Um, well, for a start, the a lot of after school activity, well, just by definition, would be would be after school. So um, some of that community use would would be straight away after after school. Um, it's where we've replicated this sort of um, arrangement previously. Um, it's incumbent upon the governing body and the school to make sure that community use does happen through whatever means that is. Sometimes that's preschool. Sometimes that's um, lunchtime activities, although that isn't that often, to be honest, and a lot of it is to do with after school and holiday time. Um, we get a, an awful lot of people saying, you know, we've, we've got no transport, we've got no cars, we've got no way of getting there. The evidence, truthfully, is that that just isn't the case. And people, if the community offer is attractive enough, and, you know, we do things like school holiday enrichment program activities during holiday times in certain schools, those are fantastic um, provisions. They are very, very, very well attended, and we put those on in our most deprived areas when we can, for the obvious reasons, because the need is is greater there, and they're always very well attended. So um, that that's all really I can say. Sorry. 
and, and I'll leave Nicola to answer your planning questions now. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Councillor. In terms of the LDP, as members will know, we are currently going through a process of reviewing the LDP. So the LDP will take us, uh, will, it covers a 15 year period and um, we are currently at the, at the point where we are developing our preferred strategy and we will be going out on uh, consultation on that preferred strategy shortly. But we have to acknowledge that some of our policies have been successful in delivering the wider aspirations of the authorities. Some have been less so. So we have to amend the LDP to ensure that we are de delivering sustainable communities going forward. And um, the member is quite correct. Um, we have to um, align our, our policies and our proposals within that plan to Future Wales, as well as all of a number of other documents, um, our energy plan, our economic delivery plan, our um, Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, um, which obviously covers covers Wales, as well as being our our Wellbeing plan um, that we've got at the local level. So we've got to tie in with lots and lots and lots of plans, but we also need to ensure that we're developing sustainable communities. And as the member indicated quite clearly and quite rightly, that we are trying to ensure that we integrate housing, schools, commercial, um, retail and community facilities as close to each other as possible. So we develop in sustainable communities. Now that is more difficult in practice than it is in theory. Um, we have gone out um, to um, consultation on our plan and we've asked uh, for interested parties to put forward candidate sites for uh, potential consideration as part of the LDP. It's fair to say that the submission of candidate sites, which will inform our strategy going forward, has been fairly low. Um, and that is for a number of reasons. Um, we, we haven't got that many developable sites which are flat, which are not affected by flooding, which are not affected by contamination, um, and which haven't got um, biodiversity interests which can be addressed. So there's lots and lots of constraints upon us. Um, but we are um, currently going through that review process to try and develop something that is as sustainable as we can get. In terms of the current LDP, it's acknowledged um, that the site is a difficult site, but it's a lot. Uh, it, we, as part of the process to identify sites, we went through a whole list of potential opportunities to identify which was the best site going forward, which was the most sustainable, which had the best access to public transport, which had the best access to um, uh, um, walking routes, cycling routes, etc., uh, active travel. Um, and this was the site that came out as being the most acceptable. Now, members will appreciate that today we are looking at the principle of making a decision as to the future of the Swansea Valley Schools. The specific issues regarding the planning process, so, you know, the impact upon highways, the impact at the, the flooding, the uh, biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera, that would be considered at the planning stage should members um, accept the recommendation today. So we would go into that at that particular time. But I think it's fair to say that whilst the, the site is currently on an area where there are playing pitches, those pitches will be uh, replaced or will be retained as best as possible and actually improved. So there will be no net uh, reduction in terms of the quality of those playing pitches as a consequence of this development. And it is going to be located immediately adjacent to an existing urban area. So as far as we are concerned, it is a sustainable location. And, um, you know, we, we, we as planners or planning professionals within the authority would not have supported our colleagues within education to take the proposal as far as it's gone if it was not acceptable in planning, notwithstanding what I've said a moment ago, that we would have to take you know, all those detailed issues into consideration as part of the planning application. But we would not have wasted members' time, time and officers' time getting us to this point if it was not appropriate. Hopefully that's answered your question. Yeah, it has. And I would just like one follow up, if that's OK. Um, Mr Thomas alluded earlier that we've done this as an authority about 40 times before. Um, how many of those 40 planning applications have been refused? Just just to be clear, I meant school reorganisation proposals, not 40 okay. new bills. Um, we've probably done 
Any new bills? Ten, ten. Eight or eight or ten new bills. Okay, and of those new bills, how many have been refused? If it is going to the planning, some of those will have been on existing school sites already, so you wouldn't have expected those to have been refused anyway because the school's on there. Um, but no, well, no, none because we wouldn't have taken it that far. Yeah, I think it goes back to what I was just saying. You know, we um, the planning application process. We have a lot of discussion at the pre-app stage. Um, where we consider principles um, associated with a school in the same way we consider principles associated with any development. And if there were major concerns regarding the principle of a scheme at those early stage discussion at points, then it wouldn't have got to the stage where a planning application would have come in. And um, it is only until a planning application comes in that we get the level of detail that will enable our officers to go through the specifics um, that we that we always go through in terms of uh, anal an analysis of a planning application. Um, and um, when those issues are identified, we can mitigate them. Uh, so, for example, if there are issues with highway junctions, then we can impose conditions uh, to ensure that those highway junctions are improved prior to commencement de development or prior to occupation of the development. So we would only allow something to get to that stage using public money to design all of those plans and to develop that evidence base if we were fairly comfortable that it was a scheme that would work and would be supported by planning officers within the council. Thank you, Nicola. Could I? Yes, Sandra. Very quickly, add to it. And, and just to be clear, that's how we end up with, or in part, how we end up with the proposal that we that we consult on, because we've done the work that Nicola's just referred to. So we know it's a site, notwithstanding all the finer planning details, but we do know it's a site which can be developed, notwithstanding its particular difficulties, wherever that might be in, in the county budget. We wouldn't be taking forward a proposal to consult on something if we knew that we couldn't build on it in the first place, notwithstanding the finer planning details. Okay, thank you, members and officers. Could I call Councillor Rosalind Davis, a local member for Godric Reich, please? Uh, um, regarding community access in the proposed new school, which community are you referring to? Um, the community of the Swansea Valley. But they're made up of many communities. I mean, the area of Godric Graig is not in the community of Pontarawa, and it already serves three villages as it is. It's not considered a, a community, a part of the community of the Godric Graig area. Okay, thank thank you, Councillor Davis, for uh, your comments on that. Do you have any further questions at this point? Um, I do wish to make a statement later on after everybody has asked yeah. questions. Diolchan Vawr. Diolch, Councillor Davis. Councillor Anthony Richards, please. Diolchan Vawr, uh, Cadeirev. Councillor um, Ken Phillips and other members asked a lot of the questions that I wanted to ask, but quickly, um, Touching on Councillor Tim Bowen's uh, point on the community impact in, in their community. I know, um, in, obviously, we've had lots of uh, discussions and debates uh, around this issue. And I know the Director of Education has mentioned previously with regards to something along the lines of clo uh, closing a school does not kill off a community. Um, and I argued at the time it does not kill off the community immediately but it is a suspended death sentence. It does take some time. And then those local shops that are so important to the community, um, eventually they can sustain. And we have a shop near, um, you know, Atwen School. We have a shop near uh, Llanguig School. And, you know, they can't uh, sustain when that local footfall is not coming in uh, on the way to the schools. Um, however, on a more positive uh, note, I was happy and really reassured, however, with one of the responses from the Director of Education and then uh, backed up by the uh, um, Director of the Environment when they mentioned that the pitches meet uh, the standard. Um, you may remember, I mean, it was about two weeks ago, I raised this issue in a briefing where I asked about the uh, strict restrictions with the leagues, etc., and that they wasn't going to have any impact or effect uh, to that. 
When we had the briefing just before Easter, officers couldn't confirm that for certain. So what work has been done over the Easter holidays to confirm that and have that reassurance? Uh, we couldn't confirm it because we didn't have the documents with us at the time. That you, You're quite correct, but um, you will know that we have now produced that work for members and sent it out to members to see, um, along with the guidelines for the, the football and the rugby associations to show that it is meeting the guidelines as required. And um, the drawings will show that there is no loss to the pitches other than one mini pitch, which um, following conversations with the sports association, uh, the people who use that mini pitch are quite happy to move on to the 3G fit pitch as needed, or we can make sure that we mitigate for that loss of that pitch within that overall build somewhere, because at the moment we're only at the very early design stage. So does, does that answer your question? So we are confident now that that, that is the case. Yeah, and with regards to uh, those pitches, um, the obviously because we're talking about the primary schools here, uh, they will be able to use uh, all of those facilities, um, even though we've losing one of the mini pitches. Absolutely, the primary schools can use, yeah, whatever whatever they need to use out of those. And those decisions will be had at a later date. You know, there's there's no decision to be had at the minute as a discussion, but yes, that's absolutely the plan. Um, regarding the pupil numbers, I have um, raised this a number of times. There seems to be an inconsistency in the planned pupil numbers. And to me, the pupil, uh, the pupil numbers make absolutely no sense. And that could just be me. But the proposal to close three schools and rehouse them in this new school means that the numbers fall short of the capacity of the school. So if we were to close all of the schools tomorrow, rehouse them in the new purpose built school, there's not enough pupils to be able to fill that school. So I know I've asked this question at every debate, every seminar, every bit of correspondence, but I am still struggling. And with this updated report, I have to be honest, I'm even more baffled than I was before. Uh, so for transparency, my question is, where did you get these numbers from or these figures from? Yeah, thanks, Council. Which is when we plan um, a new school, we have to um, build that school and design and, you know, in terms of our capital application for Welsh funding, because obviously the more pupils, the bigger the school, the more money is needed. So we have to look at the number of pupils in the catchment that that school is going to serve. Um, and when you look at the catchment for um, this particular proposal, um, the number of pupils that uh, we've included in the design and in, in, in the proposal meets the number of children who could claim a place in the school. Just for clarity, it does not include any Welsh medium pupils. Uh, and just for further clarity, as um, you know, as I think it's really important, and so I'm glad you've asked this question, there are no intentions to close any further schools in the Swansea Valley um, in in the future. This is this is a um, not a stalking horse for future school closures. It's um, I know I know the numbers when you look at the numbers in the three existing schools, but it's to do with future planning, housing development, and the number of children who live in the communities who could claim a place should they wish to. And of course, it's a school for the next 40, 50 years as well. So we've got to future proof it as well. So um, I hope that answers your question, Councillor Richards. Yeah, just to convert. So when you talk about, um, you know, I, st I still don't understand where these where these pupils uh, are coming from. And, and with the latest, um, in the latest report, we had a situation whereby um, the numbers keep falling year on year. They don't increase, so they keep falling. So, for example, in 2027, we would be in a position, I apologies, my maths is, is not great, um, that we could potentially have 428 pupils based on predictions. I appreciate they are predictions. Um, and of course, this is a school for 770 pupils. I am really reassured and I appreciate that you have mentioned and you have categorically stated, in fairness, you have categorically stated on a number of occasions that there will be no further schools will close to accommodate this new school. And I will take that with the utmost good faith. And I am sure the community absolutely welcome those assurances. But I'm sure that you can understand people's grave concerns with regards to this, because as I've said before, 
Let's look at previous consultations from the past, including that of Esculcombe Bromville. This also had spare capacity. The school was given the go ahead. Then Cameravan Comprehensive School gets closed to make up their numbers. No transparency from the start and no opportunity for the community of the Avon Valley to be involved in the consultation of Esculcombe Bromville. Now, I don't want this to be imposed on Reed of Rowe Primary School in the future, and I'm sure Councillor Marcia Spooner or the community of Rose does not want this imposed on Rose Primary. Um, so again, what assurances can you give regarding the pupil numbers? We're in a situation whereby, as uh, my colleague, um, um, Councillor Goldup John uh, stated, you know, we're in a situation whereby we have our community is surrounded by floodplains. We are um, surrounded by alleged landslips and actual landslips. So where are these pupils coming from? Dear Khamar. I'm sorry, Councillor Richards, I don't have any other response from you other than the number of children who live currently in the catchment of those three schools plus some future planning in terms of future proofing because of the housing developments which are proposed in the area. Um, and I can only re-emphasize once again, and I'm, I'm glad that you are glad that I've re-emphasized it once, is that there are no planned school closures in the Swansea Valley, save for the three which are mentioned in this proposal. So I can't really answer your question in any other way, I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, members and officers. Councillor Charlotte Goldsworthy, you had your hand up, but I'm just confirming that you don't want to speak because it's now down. No, I'm fine. Uh, well, go on. What I was going to say is basically I've had school closures up in the community and it's just in regards to some of the comments that have been made about um, the impact on communities. Um, I'm a bit, um, obviously Tim lives in his community, but being a neighbouring um, councillor, I've never actually seen Palena be thriving so much as a community as in events and that and that's obviously coming out of the good work that council as a community and the community council are doing as well um, and that's the same as obviously my own ward um, Britain, Northwood and Carmarthen where obviously the schools all merged into Carmarthen. Um, the, the lot of um, my experience has been is the parents and the, the grandparents had the biggest issues rather than the children but the children themselves are thriving, the new friends and, and the relationships and everything else. And together as a community, we've overcome the transport issues or anything like that. So I think, you know, when you're going down this road of, you know, destroying communities and this, that and the other, I, I you know, it, it, I haven't personally seen it. But again, I, I will hold my hand up and I don't know the Pontedawi area that well either. So, you know, I'm not going to say that every community is the same because it's not. But I just wanted to obviously put, you know, our experience over here as well. Thank you for that. And thank you for acknowledging that all communities are different. And I think that's really important to acknowledge, you know, during this process. I see no further indication. So we will move on now to transport highways issues, including safe routes. Oh, sorry. Councillor Sonia Reynolds, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it's you know, waiting, trying to wait politely until everybody else who's listed has spoken. So sorry about that. Um, I was uh, just wanting to ask officers if uh, the, the figures in the report for pupil numbers have taken account of the baby boom that we've seen, you know, involved in running a nursery locally, uh, which uh, has seen a huge dramatic rise in children numbers in the area. Has that been taken account of? In addition, wanting to say that, again, we had two school closures in our area. Um, the communities are different, but you know, we're in the Ammon Valley. We're not that far away. We have seen both sets of buildings taken over by the community that were closed and developments happening within them that are very positive and have grown the community activity. So, you know, it's it's that area of thing. I'm wondering whether the council is considering uh, the future use of those buildings in the communities should they be, should the uh, schools be closed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. Um, 
in terms of the baby boom, no, we haven't considered that. But what we have done is use our our, um, our sort of experience and judgment to realise that regardless of the individual schools, over the last 10 years, over 160 children have, have the numbers have increased by 160 children in 10 years across the Pontedewi area and the Swansea Valley area. Um, we are aware of the of the growth of, of childminders and um, childcare facilities in the area. And we know that they're, you know, it's a thriving area. There are a lot of children coming through. So really, it would be foolhardy to just build a school for what you've got. We've never done it before. And, and on the one occasion that we did within, well, before the school even opened, we had to put additional classrooms on because we knew you know, we could see straight away that there were more people who wanted to come there than we'd originally planned. So, you know, it just seems sensible to future proof. I'm going to bring Councillor Anthony, Councillor Anthony Richards in because it's relation to this point, and then I'll call Councillor Timbo when, please. Thank you. Yeah, it's just a point of clarity, really. I mean, um, when uh, Councillor Reynolds just mentioned a baby boom, I mean, I've noticed here no pa post pandemic baby boom as overall birth rates declines. Um, the um, Office of National Statistics show the wild numbers of birth may have increased slightly in 2021. The figures reflect the long term trend of decreasing live births seen before the pandemic. So what baby boom are you referring to? Unless in GCG there's a particular. <laughs> Bond chair. Yeah. yeah, you respond and then we'll and, move and, on. You know, I'm I'm a trustee of a childcare facility. We've now got a waiting list for our baby room. Um, it's we've had to increase numbers. It's it's been quite dramatic in the last year and two years almost. Yep. Councillor Timbo, when then, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just an answer to uh, Councillor Goldsworthy. Yeah, I can understand the last five years, Tom Alpont, Ven, they are booming now with all the events that uh, the Community Council, along with myself, Jeremy, and the rest of the volunteers are doing. But when the school was closed, we lost the shop. Events and stuff don't fetch shops back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bowen. Does anybody else have con any comments regarding the community impact? Councillor Wayne Carpenter, please. I think most of us growing up would have hung out with the pupils of our school. And it does concern me when we've got large school where children are being bused as much as four miles, maybe more, I don't know, whether or not they still have that social connection with pupils from their school anymore. Um, our scrutiny in education is also about well-being. And I'm concerned about the well-being in a day and age when we are trying to get children out of their bedrooms, away from their games consoles and their televisions, and to meet in the evenings with their friends. And I've just got a concern about that, that that sense of community for the children can be lost in these situations. Thank you. I mean, that, that, that it's a potential risk. I wouldn't, you know, you, you can't deny that. Um, but I think my response to it would be having more having more peers in a much larger school, the opportunity for that social interaction is far wider. Um, you are right. Um, young people tend to socially interact now on on um, you know technology, which isn't always a good thing, but it's not it's not exclusively. And we've also got to remember that children in school, thirty nine weeks a year and sort of five, six hours a day, um, they live their lives, you know, in their communities, holiday times, evenings, weekends. So there's no reason why, um, if planned properly, that, that that risk that you mention, which you, you know, you're know perfectly entitled to and you're right to, to mention it as a risk, should actually manifest itself. And in fact, um, the opportunities that, that children will have in, in far you know, better schools in terms of physicality and, and provisions and uh, resources, it should actually broaden the horizons and their well-being should improve, not, not be detrimentally impacted. That's certainly the intention anyway. Thank you. Councillor Matthew Crowley, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just on this point alone, uh, going back to myself and my childhood, I went to St Joseph's Comprehensive, uh, which is based in Port Talbot, as you know, and we had students from Clidda, the Valleys and everywhere else come, uh, you can imagine. You had to be a Catholic to go there in them days uh, for obvious reasons, because of its nature. And, of course, we accepted children Catholics from all parts of the uh, at that at that county borough at that time, which was West Glamorgan. 
Uh, as you know, my own children went to Row 7, YG Row 7, and they had to go. Unfortunately, at that time, we never had the provision of Bro D or the St. Fries Estate, which I welcome, and of course, welcome Welsh education. I'm not a Welsh speaker myself, but uh, I found it vitally important that my children would be Welsh speaking. And they never lost that aspect. Most of my uh, children's, uh, my daughter was in school with you, with yourself, Rebecca. So uh, you fully understand that we're, from the community aspect that we're talking about, I don't see that that's a, is a loss. She gained more friends from Pontedawi than she did from Sandfields area. So I just like to put, put that point across that, uh, you know, it's community. It works both ways. It's not just all one way as I'm, as I'm listening to this afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Just comments there then. Um, no problem. So we move on to transport, highways issues. Councillor Richards. Apologies. Um, sorry, I just had a, um, a thought. Nicola says that there is a limited a suitable um, sites. Where will they build the houses for the 300 plus additional poop bills? Just for us to know. We've got existing allocations within the plan, um, which have not yet been delivered, and it's for the wider um, Swansea Valley area. Um, and as part of the review of the local development plan, that's exactly what we're looking for. We're identifying what sites that we can deliver within uh, the valley uh, areas as well as along the coastal corridor. And that information will come out as part of our preferred strategy towards the end of this year, but it hasn't actually been confirmed what, where the sites are yet because they're still under consideration. Thank you very much. I am going to move on now to uh, transport highways issues, including safe routes to school. And first, can I call Councillor Massia Spooner, please? Yeah, I do. I've just got more of a specific routes to school plan. We we know we've had a plan for Ashdwen, but I'd like to know what's, what's about Bryn Morgrig in Ashdwen, because you'd have to be crossing the village to move the safe routes to school plan I've seen. And I'm just wondering how the poopers would go down from there. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, the safe, uh, as, as I've explained previously, the, there are safe routes already from Altwen, from, from all the areas, because there's a school there already. So um, I don't know the details of those plans. I'm not sure there'll be any officers on the call who knows the details of, oh, you do, Jim. Oh, OK, I'll stand back then and I'll let Nicola answer, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> from Ashwen Primary um, down to the site of the um, the proposal that we're talking about today, it's a distance of 1.139 miles or 1.833 kilometres. It's along uh, Lon Tanarast. Um, you go onto a footpath over the footbridge crossing that goes over the A467, and you go down to a pedestrian crossing which goes around the Tesco car park, over another footbridge over the ri river to Sleas Clanaraven, then on to Anisteru Road, and then you're at the school. Yeah, sorry, I was asking specifically from Bryn Morgrig, because you're walking up a road, you're going to have to cross a roundabout to go up the hill to Tanarast and across, so that's what you're saying, it's from the school, and everybody has to go to the school first and then go down. Yeah, what, 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 when we were asked in a previous meeting where the safe routes to school were for the children in those areas, the problem that we have is that those children lived in tens or even hundreds of different addresses. So we couldn't work out the, say, the route for every single child within that catchment area. So we made a decision that we would calculate the route from the existing schools to the site which is under consideration today. So we've 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 actually circulated those plans, I believe, to members. Um, so we've got a safe route to school for the former Godrigraig Primary School site, uh, for Slanguig and for Ashtwen. And they're all on those plans. And I've got the measurements for you if you want me to explain further. But we have um we have distributed those to members already. Um Rhiannon, please. And just to say as well, should the proposal progress, then at the point of the school getting ready to open, um, every every pupil who will be going into that school will have their route assessed. So, you know, even people living in an outlying sort of, their route will be assessed to make sure that it's suitable in line with, with these ones here. So, you know, if, if it hasn't been done already, it will be done by then. 
just for a point of clarity here for me, so the safe routes to schools aren't from the child's address, they're just from the school. Oh, they're from the child's they are from the child's address. Uh, but you haven't got them. No, because we don't, at the, at the moment in time, we don't know which children will be attending that school at that time, obviously. So if there are children in Clumtowie, then we probably would have, but we haven't, we haven't got for children who are not actually enrolled at the new school yet. Okay, and this one, did you want to come back? Okay, I've got Councillor Timber, when it was indicated, please. Yeah, just one quick question. All these uh, safe routes, a um, few of them seem to be going over bridges and so forth. Are all these lit up? Yeah, th there's criteria that we have to comply with in terms of safe route to school. And I can confirm that they they comply with all criteria, inclu including lighting. Um, they've been walked by uh, officers within the council. Um, and uh, as a consequence of matching all of those criteria, they are considered to be uh, safe route to, to school for the purpose of the legislation. Thank you. Councillor Daniel Thomas, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a question around the traffic management plan. What work has been done looking at the roads in and around the proposed site so far? And what would be the estimated cost to the local authority in terms of work carried out? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, shall I, I'll come in first and it maybe if I don't answer you fully, I can rely on colleagues. Um, you'll appreciate that um, we haven't had a decision whether or not to pursue the, the development of this school as yet. And it costs a significant sum of money to pull all the evidence together to do transport assessments, transport impact reports, travel plans, etc. So those would come should members um, take the decision today to approve the school. They will come as part of the planning process. So whilst we've had um, sort of an overall assessment done to make sure that the site can be accommodated or can accommodate a school without having a negative impact. We haven't gone further than that at this stage because we need that decision. However, those issues will be covered under the planning application process. Um, we are fairly confident that the network or the existing highway, highway network can accommodate the traffic movements associated with the proposed school. But it may well be that we need to make uh, um, minor amendments to the highway to ensure that it is um, improved um, to accommodate both the existing and the proposed vehicle movement. But that would be picked up as part of the planning application process, not as part of this process. But going back to what I've said earlier, transport colleagues have been involved in all the discussions up to this point and had it been a, a, a non-starter we again wouldn't get at this point because our highway colleagues would have said no we cannot accommodate this scheme at this particular location thanks nick i'm and i'm giving um clive bernard early warning that i might be calling you in clive so please listen um but he, he has said in um, previous briefings with members that uh, obviously we've got to accept that some planning work has been done because obviously of the of the the, the former process. Um, I think a traffic impact assessment was undertaken at that point. It'll, if we move forward, it'll need to be refreshed. But I'm pretty confident that the um, when the highways people and the um, our engineers looked at it, it's only very minor works that would be needed to be undertaken to the highway network, not significant. Um, because as Nick says, we, you know, when we decided this site, we did look at all of these various issues before we said, right, that's the one we need to consult on. So Clive, I don't know if you want to confirm or deny what I've just said. Or Justin, is it? Sorry, Justin, I do beg your pardon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Looking at it, as, uh, as Andrew said earlier, you know, we, we're currently in a position where we've, there's a draft transport impact assessment that has, uh, that has been or in the process of being completed. Um, but like we said, we will look into the fine details as my colleague and my director said, Nicola Pierce, when and if this, this uh, gets moved forward and goes to planning, we can then assess what uh, the uh, criteria that they put in the modeling to see whether which arms are saturated, if any, and what can be looked at in terms of any highway improvements. The one thing I, I would like to bring um, in addition to this conversation, but nevertheless related to traffic, and we've I've thought about this development for some time, having been involved in various meetings, 
Um, we currently got uh, Godra Gregg School in existence there, and that was covered or included, I should say, as part of the survey that was undertaken over seven days. And the survey itself was undertaken over seven days in a neutral month from 7.30 a.m. in the morning till 7 p.m. in the evening, all over the seven days, to have an idea of what the traffic um, flows are like existing on the, on the public highway. It's equally important to mention to members the, this afternoon that you have Althwent School and Languk School, which is not uh, that far away within the catchment area, and arguably uh, a strong percentage of the day-to-day -day traffic to and from those schools are also used in the highway network, which would therefore be picked up and included within that survey. Yes, you know, it, it, there, there is, uh, there is um, no argument whatsoever that it is congestion and you know like most schools during pick up and drop off time uh, there are mitigation measures we can look at not just on the public highway but there's management plans within the school that can be also looked at as well but i just think it's important to mention that that whilst we uh, we don't know the full facts yet in terms of what the outcome of the full modeling is at this stage because we've not assessed it in great detail at this point because um, that will be done, obviously, uh, scrutinised at a later date should this um, move forward after today's uh, discussion. Thank you. Hopefully that's answered your question, by the way, sorry. Councillor Caroline Lewis, please. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Um, my question is to do with home school transport. Uh, when it's previously been put out to tender. We haven't had enough or limited amount of companies coming forward for the work. Is there enough capacity within the industry to meet the future demand of the new establishment and the numbers required in transport? Uh, and more planning has been done for this. Uh, Ken might have touched on my next question. How are we going to accommodate the provision of after school clubs and preschool nursery uh, for those that don't reside within the locality and solely rely on home school transport? And I just wanted to add this because I'm aware that three to five year olds, unless they're in full time education, they don't actually, they're not entitled to transport. I think eight miles a day is a huge ask for a three year old to get to school and back if they don't have transport. Are we as an authority going to put on any provision to meet those needs? Because you'd be here to see a decline in children attending the nursery due to transport. So lovely, thank you. Uh, thank you. In in terms of the um in terms of the transport, well, obviously this school isn't due to open until 2025, so I, I I can't say categorically that everything will be fine or everything may not. But um in, in the early modelling that we've done suggests an extra um an extra bus. We've got two buses already coming down from the God de Grey, Gatslavera area to Park um, and Estero, so this would be an additional one. The biggest impact we have and the problems we're having at the moment is the taxi operators and ALN transport. Um, the bus companies don't seem to be such an issue, but I'm touching wood very quickly because, um, you know, who knows? Who knows what the future holds? But um, I can't categorically say we'll be fine because I don't know. It's too far away to, to, to say. But um, hopefully, because it's only one extra bus at the moment that we think we're looking at, that, that should be OK. Um, in terms of after school provision, We've got lots of children all over Neath Batalba who travel to school by bus. Um, what, we, what we find and what we would be expecting the governing body to do here, and what we would certainly ask them to do and, and be in discussions with them to do, is to make arrangements so that the children can access after school clubs. So, for example, what we find in other schools is that they arrange, say, twice a week for um, the buses to come later so that all the children can access some sort of provision and some sort of club. Uh, and that, that's worked very well. Um, sometimes additional minibuses or something are put on. Again, you know, that, that's a decision for the governing body and the school to decide. But there is absolutely no reason why these children should miss out. Would the school then have to pick up the cost? Uh, it depends. The minibuses, uh, because not all children, depending on work commitments and activities outside the school, not every parent wants their child to stay for after school clubs. So logistically, that could be difficult couldn't it all i can say is that it happens elsewhere and it and it it seems it seems to work well you know i haven't um we've had the, these conversations many times with okay. school reorganization and when we've gone back the first, one of the first questions we ask is how have you managed the after school provision and and they've managed it in many different ways sometimes they do lunchtime clubs for example 
you know, it depends on the size of the school and depends on the staff available and the governing body and their willingness to do it. But it, it doesn't need to be a barrier for, for after school. It, it, for me, though, it would feel that the more um, deprived children would miss out because those that have transport would pop down and pick them up where others would struggle and just go home at half three, wouldn't they? So that would be my concern if the transport wasn't there for everybody and available. Again, that would uh, would depend on the school and the governing body. And there are deprived, there are many deprived schools in Heathrow Talbot, as you know, and they manage the situation satisfactorily. Councillor Spooner, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, good evening. Yeah, so it's a bit of a bit both really on the pupil numbers and saying, you know, we see a shortfall. And the buses you mentioned coming from Slavera and Godric Rag down to Pontadawa currently. Has anybody done any sort of assessment on whether parents who choose English medium education for their for their children living in a Slavera will send their children five and a half miles down the road or take them out to county, which is one point something miles with a new school and a swimming pool? I can tell you what happens now. Uh, there are certainly children from a Slavera travelling down by bus now to God Greg, um, because God Greg is a catchment school. Uh, and they're equally, there are around 70 children who travel to Gologocum and um, um, what's the other one, Brintowry Brinta in, in, uh, in Powys. So, you know, people are choosing where they want to go at the moment. My, my gut feeling, if I'm honest, is a brand new school in Park and is there who won't see any more travelling that way. They probably come down this way because if they're doing it already and they're going to port cabins, I can't see why they would decide then they're not going to do it to come to a brand new school. But I, I, once again, we, you know, 2025, the school is due to open. I don't know what the circumstances will be at that time and I can't predict what parents will choose to do. Um, but that's not something that is concerning officers at the moment, if I'm honest. Sorry. Can I come back? I'm just wondering, and I congratulate the parents of Godric Reich for persevering and sending their children down to Port Cabins. But if this were to go ahead and it was a permanent move to Pontadawa, even though with a brand new school, would parents then begin to turn away and say, you know, it's easier for us to go up to a second life than it is down there? That, that's a concern for me in that we'll be then having children going out to county for their education. Well, there are already a considerable number of children choosing to do that. Um, but obviously, children who are travelling out of county are not catchment children. And at some point, those schools will refuse them. So then we need to make provision for them within our own schools and our own catchment, hence the pupil numbers. Can I just answer um, Councillor Lewis's question about nursery children as well? Um, and you're absolutely right. We don't transport nursery children. Uh, it, it's, um, it's a Welsh government policy. It's not necessarily the Talbot policy, but that is with, it's within our power to not our power, your power as members as a council to look into that and make changes should you want to. Um, but that would probably be a decision for a later day, not not for, as part of this. Okay, thank you. Can I call Councillor Nathan Gold of John, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, so. Based on paragraph 67, um, it says that Altwen and Tlangu primaries already have a high percentage of pupils who travel to school by car or taxi, um, and the averages work out at about 60%. With catering for the new school, that would be an additional about 380 private vehicle trips to the new school if it's still 60%, and we're working on the 750 pupils, six, 630 full-time pupils. My question is, which which is a failure, by the way, because Clangu and Godregreg are in the middle of their villages and they should no way have 60 percent of people driving there. That That is a failure on all of us because we should make sure that they should be able to walk and cycle safely in their local communities. But I digress on that point. Um, how are we going to ensure that pupils going from those valley schools can safely use active and active travel to get down the val uh, valley to Ponce Tower because I'm, I'm a keen cyclist and there's no way you would find me cycling down those busy roads at nine o'clock in the morning let alone five to eleven year olds that serious it's a serious concern of mine okay we, we'll we'll do a, a joint answer <laughs> first of all first of all this, this proposal has moved on, it's, you know, from when it was originally um, proposed, when it was originally thought out and planned four years ago, we were in a we were in a different position now. 
the work on Rosavan um, recently, which is for a very sustainable, um, uh, you know, community-based school, has opened our eyes to some of the possibilities, some of the things that we could do to make sure that pupils are able to walk and to cycle and to do that. So in terms of the school proposal itself, although we haven't done that work on this proposal, we've done it for Rosavan and it's made us aware of what perhaps could be achieved for the school with a little bit more time and more, um, you know, if, if it progresses further. Um, in terms of the of the routes, I'll, I'll pass over to, to Nick. Oh, sorry, the other thing I wanted to say is the... Um, the children who are travelling by car, you have, we have to be aware as well that in Altwen and Godregreg and Langook, there are substantial numbers of children who are not attending the local school. They are not attending the catchment school and there are children in the catchment who are going further afield again. So these, these cars are all over the road going everywhere. It's not necessarily the children who live in there who, who may be driving there. But having said that, it is a very high, it is a high percentage of, of cars on the road. So, yeah, I'd pass over. Yeah. Um, in terms of active travel, um, uh, members will probably appreciate that this is a big priority for Welsh Government at the moment and they've been investing quite heavily in active travel for a number of years. Um, we've got a um, an integrated network map for Neath Patol, but which identifies our existing routes and we've had to we have we've had to assess those routes against a number of criteria um, within the active travel legislation um, and what that map will tell us going forward is which routes wh where the gaps are in active travel provision and what potential routes we can put in to ensure that communities have maximum access to those um, access travel routes. So we'll be able to use that information to put forward bids to Welsh Government to secure grant funding to actually develop further our at active travel network. But it's fair to say that the active travel network at the moment in East Patol, but definitely needs improvement. And that is what we as officers will be seeking to address going forward. Yeah, just for, for members to note, I'm going to allow members to come back only once now, just because time is going on. OK, thank you. So with the new proposal, are we saying there's going to be a active, uh, a high quality active travel route from the top of the valley to Ponte Dewe? No, we, 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 we won't have an active travel route integrated as part of this proposal now. We will have to secure additional funding for that. What we've indicated is there is a safe route to school that can be accommodated um, within the existing network and we've issued maps to that effect. But any future active travel routes that we need to develop will be reliant upon Welsh Government funding and we'll have to put bids in for those separate to this process. Thank you, Diolch. Councillor Anthony Richards, please. Great, Diolch and Fawr, uh, um, Just a, a lot of questions have already been, uh, been asked and given that I can only come back once, I better be <laughs> concise. Um, when we have questioned this, you know, it says in the report as well that uh, the issue of traffic in and around the Ponte Dower area has been raised repeatedly during the consultation and would appear to be one of the most frequent reasons for disagreeing with the proposal. But yet, you know, members have asked questions today and we still don't have that clarity. Um, and, you know, I've said this, I've said it numerous times. Um, you know, we've been told it would be the contractor's responsibility to deal with these issues. Then when we asked how this would be paid for, you said that the local authority would be picking up the tab. This is a complete and utter can of worms. You can't tell us how it's going to be done, how much it's going to cost, and you're expecting all of us as councillors who are honour bound by our constituents um, to ratify this decision when we would be basically allowing this council to sign a blank cheque. So, you know, I, I just can't understand when we haven't answered these questions. You know, um, Councillor Spooner asked about the suitable walking routes to Park Anisteru from Ashtwen and from the Bringmore Grieg site. But well, that can't be done at the moment. But in the report on uh, 69 of page 17, it says suitable walking routes to Park Anisteru from Ashtwen and Llangu catchment areas are in existence and have already been assessed. What is that assessment? Because when uh, Councillor Spooner asked the question, oh, we haven't quite done that yet because it's only if members want to progress with that proposal. So this report 
unless you can clarify differently. And this is the issue that I've had with these reports from all of the um, discussions that we've had, the numerous discussions, is that the report says one thing. If I was a councillor trying to ratify this decision on a decision that was happening in Port Talbot, I would read this report and think, yeah, I'm, I'm all for this school. But as you can see, the local knowledge here is telling you something differently and we're not having answers to these questions. So I, I'll ask again, how can we ratify this decision and sign off a blank check? How much is this going to cost? An estimate, I'm happy with an estimate. Let's also take into consideration that when you put the business case in, inflation has rised significantly. The, um, the process of applying for funding from the Welsh Government um, when we when we put the funding envelope together, we make provision for um, the 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 things that you don't have answers to. So we know that there will be some uh, costs associated with some of the work out, outside of the school, uh, and we make provision. Um, and the process allows us to make that that provision. So I suppose the only comfort I can give members is where we've you know we're close to two hundred million pounds of investment now. Um, Nicola's team, Clive Bernard and his team are um, excellent at making sure that we deliver these schools within the funding envelope, which we apply to Welsh Government uh, for. Um, in terms of the additional cost that you refer to, you, you're quite right. Obviously, cost of construction have gone up since 2018, 2019, sort of um, exponentially. That's certainly the, cost, the case across Wales. Welsh, we've had discussions with Welsh Government around that. And um, they accept that that is the case, and they will have to. Uh, so their 65% contribution they know will increase, as we know our 35% contribution will increase. So, um, but we have officers who are very experienced at making sure that we deliver um, these schemes within the funding envelope that is agreed. Albeit there's a recognition because of the exceptional circumstances around COVID, and we can always argue about why costs have gone up as much as they have. Um, in, in terms, there's a process attached to the 21st Century Schools programme, which enables us to go back to Welsh Government and ask for additional funding to reflect their 65%, but quite clearly as well, there's a there's an additional contribution from the local authority because our 35% contribution will have increased as well. Yeah, so that 35% from the local authority for any traffic congestion, you know, I've made representations um, numerous times um, you know, I am pleased to see, you know, the report has amended from previous reports where we were told that there was no traffic issues. And then, you know, it was through questioning that, you know, I quoted the headmaster, the head teacher at the time of Cum Tower School, where they said that they'd experienced traffic issues around uh, the school and that they've engaged with the support of the local authority and the police over the past five years. And it's been highlighted in their safeguarding audit undertaken by the school. And the main issues they experience involve the volume of traffic around, along for uh, Park and Estero. And as you can imagine, this is further compounded in poor weather as more families use their cars to transport children to and from the school. Uh, this, um, When we went out to consult with Cum Tower School at this point, uh, Godre Greig School was in Godre Greig community. Um, so it wasn't further exacerbated through that, uh, through the primary school. Um, but, you know, the site will need to be able to satisfy the transport needs of both the primary school and Cum Tower School, as well as the industrial uh, site and the shops, etc. And the leisure centre. So, again, what proposals do the council have to alleviate these concerns? Both Godra Greig and Llanguk primary schools are situated more than two miles from the site of the proposed new school. And I would welcome further clarity on the plans that would be put in place to support those families who have no access to private transport. Um, I think it's been said previously, well, actually, we have no evidence of that. Um, can you provide that? Uh, can you provide that evidence? And also, I'm particularly concerned about the impact on the younger pupils, as my colleague uh, Caroline Lewis stated, Councillor Caroline Lewis stated. Um, and, you know, um, parents will understandably be concerned about the safety and well-being of younger children. 
um, especially for many uh, new school starters, beginning nursery at three is a huge step. And for a parent to leave a child at the school door with a class uh, teacher can be stressful enough. But having, um, well, they're not going to be put on a on a school bus anyway. Um, but, you know, what about the parents who have got children who uh, are in nursery and children who are above, you know, in years four, five, six, et cetera? How many, um, uh, how many um, times will they have to transport their children? And for those who will be uh, transporting children to school by car, further detail is needed as to the proposals for um, the on-site parking and what specific arrangements will be in place for the dedicated drop-off points. I could see some in the plans that they, there is uh, some there, but we've got to remember as well that that road getting into that school, to be able to do any work on that road, I have been told by officers previously that, Anthony, oh, Councillor Richards, it's on a bridge. You know, it's going to be significant costs. It's going to be millions of pounds for us to be able to do work on that bridge. And also to put a Pelican crossing when I wanted it because there's a residential uh, home um, down near that site. For them to be able to cross on their mobility scooters, because people, quite frankly, are too scared to get into our town centres by crossing on that uh, on that road. I've been told we can't put a Pelican crossing on that site because it would mean that uh, the traffic would back up onto a very busy roundabout. So, uh, you know, you're surprised in some seminars that people have raised a lot of questions about the traffic issues. We live in these communities. You know, thank goodness this meeting's this afternoon because half of us wouldn't have been able to get here if the meeting was in the morning because traffic would have been backed up. So what is going to be done about this? Who is picking up the costs? Uh, there's just so many unanswered questions. Nicola, <laughs> possibly? I'm, I'm not really sure what I can say on this. Um, we have, um, we've obviously looked at and assessed the appropriateness of this site in terms of the highway network. Um, and we're fairly comfortable that the highway network can accommodate the vehicular movements of the existing um, swimming pool, the uh, Kumtawi School, as well as the temporary accommodation uh, for the pupils from the Godja Greig um, School. We're fairly comfortable with that. What we cannot answer at this particular point in time is how much it all is all going to cost because we haven't had it costed. We've got grant funding from Welsh Government, as um, uh, Andrew has indicated already. Um, and But we are mindful inflation has gone through the roof. Um, it's projected to fall by the end of this year, um, and hopefully it will fall at, um, at a pace which will enable us to deliver all of our big strategic projects in the way that we want to, because it's a problem for us across the council area, not just in terms of school schools, and it's a, a problem for the country in general. Um, so I can't give you a cost. Um, what I also can't say is whether or not there will be any need for any amendments to that highway net network, whether we'll need to include any additional arms to the roundabouts that are in place down there or any improvements to junctions, because that will be considered as part of the next detailed piece of work. But what we are comfortable with is that the network generally can accommodate the volume of traffic and we will ensure that the safety of pupils in that particular area, those walking to school or cycling to school, will be of paramount importance um, when we are assessing the impact on highway and pedestrian safety. Thank you. Uh, Chair, can I just come back? Thanks, thanks to the officer for that uh, report and I hope uh, the Cabinet members have been listening to the fact that we can't have um, with respect, I appreciate what you're saying, and this is no criticism on you personally, but uh, that we have no cost ins uh, to this. So this proposal could go through and we may have to foot this bill when we come to our budget debates. Thank you. Councillor Roslyn Davis, please. Yes, regarding safe routes to school, there isn't a single pupil that attends Godra Greg School will be able to walk because they live two plus miles and up to 
four and a half miles from the school in the first place. Thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, pupils who live uh, further than two miles away from a school are eligible for transport assistance, which is why God guide pupils are being bussed down currently. And that's the same for children who may be in Llanguk living outside of the distance or for Altwen as well. And that's right across the county and it follows the, the Neath Patalba travel policy. I know that, but it, so it's pointless speaking about uh, safe routes to school in my area for the new school. Uh, you've put yourself on mute, Councillor Davis. I'm not sure if you have anything to add. No, I've just made a statement. No. OK, thank you. Diolch yn fawr. Councillor Sean Percy, please. Uh, Diolch, David, and um, no, th thanks so far to, to all um, members for the discussion. And uh, Councillor Gilder John Storm, I think a little bit on some of my questions, but um, I've got a few more points to make on sustainable transport and, and perhaps get a, some assurances from officers on that point. Um, I think there's a general acceptance that um, traffic and parking around all of our schools is a problem um, and certainly my, my view on that is that we've got a lot more to do as a council in embracing active and sustainable modes of transport and particularly in education I think the council does need to show a bit um, of leadership and also show some willingness to try and experiment with some of these innovative schemes that are happening across the country to promote walking and cycling to school where, where that is possible um, I accept there's been a bit of discussion in, in the meeting that um, some things are down to individual schools and governing bodies to implement. But I think as a council, we do need to take or consider taking some ownership of these issues if we're going to see some impact. And I think a lot of the discussions we're having today are, are a result of us perhaps not focusing on this area as much as we perhaps ought to have done. And I think what, what I'd like to see and perhaps hear from officers today is perhaps some assurance that we will be looking at how we can promote sustainable transport if the proposal goes ahead and whether we'll be looking at things like our home to school transport policy has been mentioned that, that is within the gift of members to consider but i think it is important to have that discussion around this proposal as well um you know for example um, nursery pupils are being best at the moment the current proposal as written is that that's not going to happen i'm not sure what the take-up is of that um and whether that is actually working um but Obviously, at the point we're, we're, we're making the decision, we should be making decisions that bake in good transport policy from the start. Um, you know, except if you look at the report, the existing schools do have poor figures for walking and cycling, but we don't really want to just embed that in the new school either. So I really would, particularly from education colleagues, I appreciate a lot of this might seem it, like it's a, a transport and planning issue, but particularly from education colleagues, I would really appreciate some assurance on what we might do uh, to lead the way and encouraging schools to, to use these innovative schemes, whether that's um, walking buses, whether that's um, drive and then walk, park and walk schemes, all these sort of things which are happening and, and are quite successful in some areas, but it's quite patchy in East Patalba at the moment. So that's my question, Chair. Um, my, my initial response to you, Sean, is I couldn't agree with you more. I would love to see more young people um, walk into school or, you know, using active travel, whether that be cycling. Quite, quite clearly, Nicholas referenced earlier, you have to have a proper infrastructure and, you know, that there's a, you know, Welsh Government are rolling out, you know, funding for that or, you know, on a sort of phased basis. And I, I, to me, it doesn't seem consistent, but, you know, maybe that I'm not close enough to it. But, you know, I completely agree with your point. You know, I, I get the, the health stats for our young people in terms of how physically active our young people are. And, um, you know, in some cases where, you know, we don't perform very well across Wales. Yet when we when we put something like this forward as a proposal, you know, we, we get a lot of criticism for suggesting that children should walk to school. Um, you know, we can't have it both ways. Um, either we want our children to be healthy and fit and, you know, have good physical and mental health well-being or we drop them off at the school in, in a car, uh, which is quite clearly the case in, in lots of instances at the moment. So, yeah, I'm all for it. Um, definitely something we can we can work with, and not just around this proposal, but all of all our schools. So, yeah, I'm all, I'm all for it, Joe. Just to add, <clears throat> excuse me, just to add, um, 
I also agree with you in terms of our um, response to active travel and the priority that we have given it in the past. Um, we have previously had 0.5 of an officer um, covering the whole of the responsibility for active travel, um, as well as doing other things. Um, as part of the most recent budget, we put forward a pressure to indicate that we needed to invest in this particular area of work because we were missing out on grant funding, which was being made available by a Welsh government because we didn't have the capacity to put in bids for that funding. Um, thankfully, that was acknowledged and accepted, and we had funding to um, provide two full-time posts in the active travel route, and we've actually restructured to ensure that they are uh, integrated in with our transport colleagues as opposed to our planning colleagues. So hopefully, when we get people in those posts, we will lift the priority um, of active travel and we will increase the promotion of active travel and work with colleagues across all sectors, not just education, but all sectors within the authority, including leisure, etc., to try and promote the, the, the benefits associated with active travel. And that evidence base then can also grow and enable us to perhaps be even more successful going forward in terms of securing grant funding. So it's definitely an issue that we acknowledge and we are taking forward. Councillor Percy, please. Diolch. Um, no, th thanks both for the, the responses. I think um, I, I'd make a couple of further points. Um, I, I agree with you, Nicola, in terms of um, you know needing to uh, more areas of the council to embrace active travel. And I think that's the point I was making when I was addressing my questions to education colleagues. Is I think um, across the council, departments need to know where they need to take responsibility for for some of these elements. It's not just a transport issue. Actually, in the planning and delivery of schools in the ongoing running of schools, in the guidance and support offered to schools and governing bodies, we can embed sustainable transport principles within that. And, and that is something that perhaps education need to, to try and pick up the mantle on. Uh, that's what I would like to see. Um, so I'd certainly welcome some uh, a report or something coming back from education um, to, to perhaps outline some of the things we might want to try in this area. Um, there's a lot of good practice out there if you look for it, and and it's really interesting. I, I I would recommend you spend a couple of hours on Google and have a look what's going on um, across England and Wales. Um, but just one last point for 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 Nicola really is we've discussed there's active travel routes identified on the integrated network map in the area. Um, will we be prioritising those routes in light of this proposal if it does go ahead? That would seem to be a sensible thing to do. Or whilst I appreciate there's a lot of um, schemes across the county and we, we do have a lot of pressures, it would seem sensible if this does go ahead that we would prioritise these routes and, and try and get them implemented as, as soon as possible. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've obviously got a lot large numbers of areas which are destinations for our communities, schools, retail centres, health facilities, for example, which we need to ensure are properly um, catered for in terms of not just highway network, but the active travel network as well. Um, schools are a priority for us. Um, we need to ensure that our young people are um, engaging in more active travel for the reasons specified previously by my colleagues, health, wellbeing, et cetera, and uh, uh, pollution. Uh, to try and drive down levels of pollution and congestion on our highway networks. Um, so it would it would seem sensible for us to prioritise um, on this particular site in the same way we prioritise on all of our schools within the county borough. So we look at all of our schools, what active travel they and um, opportunities they've got in that area, um, and uh, whether there is a potential route. Um, available for us to deliver in those locations because unfortunately we've got a lot of places within the county borough where we want to put active travel routes but perhaps the topography doesn't allow them to meet criteria um, or the area of land because they have to be a certain width in terms of the, the the size of the route for example and it may be that we in some areas we are quite constrained in terms of land but we will do all of it we'll do what we can to ensure that those des destinations including this potential school will be prioritized going forward okay. thank you councillor timbo when please yeah thank you chair the question i was going to ask had been asked and answered thank you that's perfect councillor clement williams please uh, thank you, Chair. Very briefly, um, 
when it comes to uh, and and members are absolutely right to ask questions they have concerns and so do parents um but i'm from powys and if we wanted to go to certain things in powys sometimes we have to travel up to newtown not necessarily just school in but there are other kids in in powys that do travel miles and miles tens of miles to primary schools um uh it's not new to us in Eastport Halbert and, and all these concerns have been raised in every school reorganisation. And um, to be fair, you know, the parents here have exactly the same concerns as everywhere else. So um, completely right to ask these questions. So uh, bear in mind, um, when I was growing up, a school governor Slavera had such a huge, a hugely a fabulous reputation. There were even kids travelling to there from um, Gosainan, and I know that as a fact. It was two children um, travelling to Gosainan to go there because the education standards were extremely important. So, sorry, it is right though, uh, Councillor Davis, it is correct. They did travel that far and the education was that good. So all I'm saying is, um, I, I hope that um, officers, and I'm sure they have taken on board all of the information, questions, etc., cetera, um, on board their issues. And I'm sure as a council, we can work our way through it if that's what the decision is today, may not be. Um, but are there figures on um, children traveling? I, I know you've mentioned that some don't go to the school um, now. Have you got uh, figures on, how many children travel uh, further than uh, their, their natural uh, nearest school um, throughout the borough, please? Uh, no, I haven't got those figures on me. We can find that out if, if you feel it is relevant, but I, I haven't got that data on me now. I've only got the children who travel out to county for this for these three catchment schools. And okay. that's around the, the three, no, it's not around the 300. It's around, um, well, there's there's 80 travelling to Powys, mm -hmm. and I believe there's around 70 travelling to Swansea. Okay. And I'm not Promise. suggesting that, like, you know, that everybody wants to do that or anything, but there are precedents for these things. That's the only point I'm trying to make. And if parents want certain educational needs, as in Welsh education, um, thankfully with East Portal, but now we've got a lovely brand new, uh, a school giving broad deer, I think is is it a school giving broad deer, something like that. Um, and we have a school giving, and a school giving has a fantastic reputation. Um, so I'm really pleased about that that it is more Welsh provision. But we've managed to give that 21st century Welsh provision to those pupils. It would be nice if we could do the same for the pupils in that area in Ponte de Wina Silvera. Thank you. Thank you for that. Just as a point of clarity, a school given a Slavera is a secondary school and we are we are talking about primary schools here. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Yeah, sorry, I was you. talking about Welsh in general. Thank you. That's OK. Thank you for your comments. OK, I think we've had quite an extensive um, debate now on highway and transport issues. So we're moving on to educational standards and I've got Councillor Wayne Carpenter, please. Thank you, Chair. I'd be interested to know when we emerge in um, smaller primary schools into what is sometimes known as the super schools, what educational standards are being achieved and what ESTIN reports are being coming from these schools now that they've been remodelled. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Carpenter. Um, well, if I point you to a most recent um, ESTIN inspection in, in, in the local authority, which was Eskol Karaki, which is not too far away from, from your um, your area anyway. Uh, that was the amalgamation of three primary schools. Um, I've forgotten the names of the schools. Bryn Hyfryd, um, Clans Sawel, and, and yeah, and Ismadi, of course, and Ismadi went for a minute. Um, when when those schools closed, one of those schools was actually just coming out to special measures with Estin. They, they'd had a bit of a torrid time. Um, Estin have just come away from that school and they, they, they've had an excellent um, inspection report. And it's been picked up throughout the report how much the learning environment has um, impacted on 
on the delivery of the curriculum and, and on things like that. I, I think it, it you know, goes without saying, I've said this many, many times, the key element to a successful school isn't the building, it's, it's you know, it is the leadership of the school the, and the teaching and learning. Um, the two go hand in hand. You don't tend to have good teaching and learning with poor leadership and, and vice versa. But we do find um, that new schools are attractive. People want to work there. They, they you know, they, they, it goes without reason, doesn't it? That it, ma it makes educating children easier in a new school. Um, and leadership and management is often better in our newer schools just because um, they're able to attract better staff. Um, the larger schools are able to, to delegate responsibility and leadership more. And the two go hand in hand and produce, um, you know, good, good, good results for the children and good outcomes for the children and good facilities for the children, which is what it's all about, really. Thank you. That's good to hear. Thank you. Can I just quickly add, um, Rihanna's quite rightly said the um, the two biggest factors in terms of standards in the school are the quality of leadership and management, not at all levels, and also the quality of the teaching, the, the practitioner. Obviously, support staff are involved in that as well. Um, the larger the school, the higher the salary um, that's attracted, the higher the salary, the more attractive the job is. Um, now, that's not to say that smaller schools can't have high quality leadership and management. They certainly can. But as a rule, um, and I've done countless numbers of headships now in terms of uh, appointments, um, we get more applicants, better quality applicants for larger schools than we do small schools. That is a fact, incontrovertible. Now, that's not to say the small schools don't have good leadership. You know, I don't want anybody running away from this meeting saying that the director said small schools have poor leadership. They don't. But it's much more difficult to, to attract, you know, a number of candidates to, to smaller schools. Thank you. Councillor Anthony Richards, please. Uh, Diolch am fawr, uh, Cadeirif. Um, can I just have a um, bit of clarity from uh, Councillor Wayne Carpenter's, uh, Carpenter's point there from Rhiannon, where you mentioned about a skull carrig here. Um, have Estyn changed the way that they do inspections recently? Not not exactly changed the way they do inspections. They don't report on data at the moment because there's no data to report on because post-COVID they haven't been um, collecting data from the schools. But in terms of the inspection, everything else is exactly the same. OK, great, because in the report you mention um, a worth three schools that were debating. So an estimate inspection good, um, awarded a good for current standards and good for prospects for improvements as the care and support and guidance offered by staff ensured that pupils worked collaboratively and independently. Um, we had, for one of our other schools, the curriculum was considered to be broad and balanced and the quality of teaching was judged good overall etc cetera, etc cetera. the same type of thing and then i have a look at the school that you have now quoted um a skull carrick here i am just for clarity i am correct the one in britain ferry is that right yeah recommendations improve pupil progress and skills especially in writing through greater challenge for more able pupils ensure the self-evaluation processes are focused to improve aspects of teaching and learning and that improvement priorities are specific and measurable. Develop effective assessment methods across the school to support pupils to know what and how to make improvements to their work. That's absolutely no criticism uh, of the school, but that is what the inspection states. If you read the inspections for the schools that we are considering today, there is a considerable difference. So you mentioned Carrig here. Um, if we have a look at Cumbromble, excuse me, Cumbromble, again, further four recommendations, recommendations um, uh, with by Baglan, et cetera, et cetera. So I absolutely um, appreciate that all schools will have rec recommendations. This is educational standards, but I think it is a little bit misleading or unfair, in le but I'm happy to be corrected, to say that these schools are going to have better educational standards than what our current schools do, because from the Estin reports, that doesn't seem to be the case. Can you clarify, Diochamar? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think I said that. I don't think I talked about standards and data. And as I said, Estin didn't collect data for a school key. What I'm saying is a new school provides better provision. And when you have better provision, you often find that you, you, you attract better leaders, you attract 
teachers who want to work in that type of school. And it, it can help to enhance the leadership, which is a key element of um, of improving teaching and learning. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not exactly saying that, but I will say that it is worth remembering as well that Estin were a statutory consultee um, as part of this proposal and that their report was attached to the consultation report. And it was certainly worth reading because, you know, they felt and I would say, and I've done this a few times now, we've done a few reorganisation processes, and I would say that that was probably one of the most positive reports I've read from Estin, because they do tend to sit on the fence a little, um, but they, they are comments in there quite clearly say that this proposal should at least maintain the standards, if not improve the standards, that are across the board. And again, I'm using the word standards then, and I, and I mean it more broadly, um, for those for the children in those schools. So um, just to come back very quickly, apologies if I uh, misquoted you, uh, Rihanna, and I, I, I take that uh, take that back. Um, but I, I still, you know, stand by the, the fact that we've constantly been told, I think when and I know we're talking about this consultation, but in previous discussions around this, we were always told, you know, the opposition at that time, and I mean the opposition in terms of the dynamics of the council, not opposition to the, the school per se, um, never talk about educational standards. Well, we are talking about educational standards and I just don't see much of a difference. I take your point that you are going to get, you're potentially going to get a higher um, calibre of play-in for a bigger school and, you know, bigger challenge, etc. Um, but I think it's fair to say that, as you've stated, um, that the standards in our schools are very good and we shouldn't be making our decision based on poor standards when we've got very good standards. Thank you. Councillor Ken Phillips, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've got a couple of questions on this and again, I'll, I'll roll them into each other because they follow quite naturally. Um, firstly, in response to a comment about negative impacts on the well-being of pupils, it's a, on page 53, it says there is no reason to assume that this would be the case. That's obviously not the same as being able to assume that it isn't the case. Uh, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Noting in particular the comments on increased bullying concerns from pupils themselves in their responses. Page 54 talks of transferring the good practice in the current schools, including leaders who walk the talk. Um, isn't that transfer going to be made more difficult by the fact that we're making those current leaders who walk the talk redundant as part of the proposal? How are we going to ensure that continuity? Secondly, on page 35, it states a new school provides greater prospects for improving educational attainment for pupils, citing an ESTIM report on performance of schools before and after moving into new buildings. That strikes me as conflating two slightly different things. Is it not the case that the Essen report is about schools moving into new or refurbished buildings, not about creating new schools? How does that take into account all of the other factors that could apply in, in creating a brand new school under different leadership in a new location outside the community it serves and so on? Following on from that, um, page 21 talks about the building bulletin 99 requirements. Am I writing thinking that those requirements only apply to new builds, not to refurbishments, and that refurbished buildings wouldn't have to meet those exact same standards. And following from that, it uh, on page 75, it says, it's, it is considered highly unlikely that the Welsh Government would financially support the patch and mend status quo approach that is being suggested. Well, to be honest, I'm not seeing where it's been been suggested that patch and mend would be preferable to refurbishment of buildings. But can you confirm whether it is the case that Welsh Government financial support is only available for new build schools and is not available for refurbishment of existing schools, which obviously would have uh, similar educational or should have similar educational benefits as cited in the in that uh, Estin report? Thank you. I'll, um, I'll try to answer a lot of questions there. If, if I miss out, uh, Councillor Phillips, just come back to me. Just in terms of how the staff are being dealt with, uh, you just meant you just made a, um, an assumption that all the staff would be made redundant. That is certainly 
it isn't the case and hasn't been the case in uh, any school reorganisation proposal that we've undertaken thus far. Um, there is, once again, um, a process that we have to go through. Um, if, if members, if we get to the end of this process and members ultimately approve it, um, we will establish a shadow governing body. The shadow governing body will be made up of the three governing bodies involved with the school. Uh, the first job of that shadow governing body will to be appoint a head teacher of the new school. The head teacher and the shadow governing body then need to come up with a structure, a structure for the new school. Um, as a local authority, we will ask that shadow governing body to take a decision to ring fence all the jobs within the new school to those members of staff within the three existing schools. And I mentioned earlier, I've done this maybe 35, 40 times, um, small scale, large scale, and haven't made one compulsory redundancy ever. Never known a gov shadow governing body not to take the decision to ring fence the jobs from the existing schools. Why would they? They're the, they're the teachers who know the children best uh, and we would want them in the new school anyway. So they'll, uh, I can't give a categorical assurance again because that's not the way the process works because it's a decision that has to be taken by the shadow governing body, but we would certainly um, be uh, emphasising the benefit and the need for making that decision so that those jobs in the new school are saved for, for the people who work in the current school. So that's the situation on staff. You mentioned something about um, well-being and uh, we couldn't give an absolute guarantee about well-being into the future. Well, we can't give an absolute guarantee about anything going into the future, just like we can't if nothing changes. So um, th that's just the way it is, I'm afraid. Um, um, funding from Welsh Government, um, does it need to, well, I think you you, you mentioned something about um, Briam, I think, Councillor Phillips. Can you remind me what your question was, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, firstly, um, the Estin report referring to uh, schools moving into new or refurbished buildings. Secondly, that refurbished buildings wouldn't need to meet the same building requirements as right, brand new buildings. And thirdly, can you just stop there? Otherwise, I'll just get lost again. Yeah, Let me just sure. answer that question first, and then I'll, yeah, and then, sure. you can, then you can carry on. Uh, if um, any school benefits from the 21st century schools, as I know it, with sustainable communities funding program now, then that um, those design elements have to meet the highest um, standards, the BREEAM standards. So we would have to, because uh, that's significant remodeling. I think that's the way to think about it. So there's a difference between patch and mend and significant remodeling. And then just to answer the last question that I, I know you asked, um, it's no, it's not true that well, Welsh Government will only fund new bills. They will fund significant remodeling as well, but they will have to satisfy the five case business model and the um, the BREEAM excellent standards around the um, you know the the design aspects and the and actually the carbon net zero as well because um, that that's something that is a requirement of local authorities when we put applications for capital funding now. And the design that we were working on for this school was carbon net zero, so I'm you know, quite proud about that. I hope that answered all your questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. For that, just to to uh, and for the clarifications on that. Just to clarify my comments on the uh, redundancies, I uh, were specifically referring to school le leaders in terms of the head and deputy head teachers, who I, unless they are separately appointed, I believe would be made redundant. Is that not correct? Yeah, you're right to um, to mention the school leaders, actually, Councillor Phillips. The position for the heads and deputies is slightly different. So when the um, uh, if the new school was established, the head teacher and the deputy head teacher post would have to be advertised nationally. That's policy. Um, obviously, the the, the, the the current incumbents would be encouraged to apply. Um, but of course, that has also been the case everywhere. We've done this sort of proposal and um, I, I still stand by what I said earlier. We've always managed to find either either one of the candidates has been successful um, within the current school or we found employment for them uh, elsewhere in the local authority. But you are right to say that the head and deputy position is somewhat different to the rest of the teaching staff and support staff in the school. Thank you for that. Thank you. Are there any further questions on educational standards, please? No, I don't see any, so we move on to the Welsh language. If I could call Council uh, Marcia Spooner, please. Um, 
I'm going to talk to the Welsh Language Impact Assessment and hope I'm reading it correctly. Now, we've got a Welsh Language Champion. Hello. We've also got the West we work with and it's a task and finish group that we're working on to improve the rates of the Welsh language being spoken outside schools. I don't know, I'm frustrated. Our school, Welsh schools are full, but we're still losing people who designate themselves as Welsh speakers. So we're working hard, we're coming up with ideas, we're working with our stakeholders on how we can improve this throughout the authority. And then I look at the impact assessment, and if I'm reading it, I've got 13 um, impacts on the Welsh language. Three are positive, 10 are not. Now we've got mitigations in this, but I just feel we're making it harder for ourselves, us on the, on the team, trying to improve things throughout the authority. Why then are we putting problems in place that aren't there at the moment? So if there are negative impacts, again, if I'm reading this correctly, we are working harder to mitigate those negative impacts in Pontadawa. Um, and I just, I don't understand why we've got enough to do without making it harder for ourselves. We want to improve the Welsh language. We want more Welsh speakers. So I don't understand why we're going, if, we, if this goes ahead, we're just making it more difficult for ourselves to, I don't know, realise our needs. So that's all. I mean, whether it's a question, you know, I could say why. That could be a question. Why are we doing it? Why are we making it hard for ourselves? Yeah. Hey, Rihanna, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, th I think... Oh, um, yeah, sorry. I think um, I think, I think you make an, a good point there, but um, just to come back to the Welsh Language Impact Assessment, uh, it, it is it is an assessment. It isn't a documented fact. We are not saying that if this proposal goes ahead, there will be 13 impacts. Three of them will be positive and the other 10 will be negative. What we are saying is we've considered the, the proposal as a whole. We've looked at the Welsh language and we've we've thought about what possible impacts there could be, positive and negative, and we've put them in this report for you to consider when you were making your decision. Now, alongside those possible impacts, and I keep saying possible because we just don't know, do we? But uh, I think we try to cover everything we possibly could from every, all the comments that we've had in, um, the conversations we've had with people in Welsh Government, with, with people in RAG, you know, all, all the different groups that we spoke to. Um, we believe that we've captured every possible um, possible impact that there might be. And alongside that, we have, we have sort of looked at a range of mitigations that could be implemented to, to sort of lessen those impacts or to improve the positive impacts. Um, and many of those actions we've taken forward and put in a WESP as well, because we feel they're really important actions, regardless of this proposal. They're something that we would want to progress and want to, to do to sort of build, to, to improve the Welsh language take up in, in our schools and our communities anyway. Um, so I do see what you're saying, but I think perhaps it's important to remember that we don't know for sure that this will happen. And we believe that the, the mitigations would prevent that happening or lessen it happen or improve the positive impacts. Does that help to make sense a little bit? Um, yeah, Dior, thank you. But yeah, so I'm just thinking why we're making it harder for ourselves when we identify in these impacts, whether they come through true or not. But it just seems which I, I get frustrated, as I said, about I don't understand why there aren't more Welsh speakers or people who identify themselves as Welsh speakers when our Welsh medium schools are full. So adding more possible negative impacts to us is making our lives harder. Thank you. Any further questions on the Welsh language, please? No, if you indulge me for a few minutes, then if you don't mind, committee. <laughs> uh, the consultation notes that any proposal for a 21st century school is about having the right school in the right place. Also, that the Swansea Valley area is a linguistically significant area as it contains the highest number and percentages of Welsh speakers in Neath Patalbert and is among the highest in Wales as a whole. Why do officers therefore think it's a good idea to build the largest English medium primary school in Wales in the middle of the Swansea Valley? Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll come back to you on that. 
Right. The um, the fact is those three schools are there. Those pupils are there. They're English medium pupils already. We're not looking to increase the English medium provision in the area. We're not looking to take children away from Welsh medium schools. In fact, as part of the Welsh impact assessment, we've we've identified where we could strengthen the Welsh medium um, provision in the area uh, as a possible mitigation, just in case that was to happen. But we, we don't believe it will. We don't believe that people choose um, you know, we make people choose Welsh medium because they want their children to be educated in Welsh. They choose English medium because because they don't, I assume, you know, it's more complicated than, than that, I realise. But um, yeah, what, what I'm saying is we are not aiming to increase English medium numbers by this proposal at all. And the mitigating action should ensure that we protect and encourage and grow the Welsh medium provision in the area as well. Uh, Welsh language primary schools, as you know, are still experiencing low pupil transfer numbers from Welsh primaries to Aslaver Brodir. One of the reasons this is, is because of the investment, the significant investment put into Kumtawa School in 1996. I remember that date because I was actually in school, so it was a long time ago, um, when they didn't put, at the time, investment into Welsh medium education. I acknowledge that we have since then. But will this proposal have a further negative impact? Um, no, I don't believe so. I, I think a lot of people say that that was the case for Kumtawi, but we we can't um, we can't prove that. And when we are speaking to, to Welsh medium parents about why they are choosing not to send their children to Aslavera, that the reasons are not about buildings. Aslavera is a brand new building now. It's got everything that they could possibly want. And, and yet they're still consistently from every one of those schools in that area, there are children who were transferred into Kumtawi. You know, it is again, I, it's more complex. And I do feel that the work that we've got planned through our WESP um, and through the work that we're doing with the English and the medium schools in the area, that we will get perhaps a clearer picture of why why that happened then and why it's why it's still happening, because that argument doesn't make sense now, does it, when you when you've got that lovely provision in a Slavera now? So and again, as I said, the impact assessment can only show the mitigations that we would we will want to put in place to make sure that doesn't happen. You'll be aware that I'm struggling with, especially with this part of the proposal. Um, and the Welsh Government report actually by Marion Police Jones stated it should be clearly underlined that no mitigating actions in the context of the future of the Welsh language in the Swansea Valley will compensate for continuing with this proposal. I just don't see how we can support this with an expert in the field saying that, along with RAG objecting and the other people that are supporting the Welsh language objecting to this plan. That's just a comment. And if you want to come back, you can. <laughs> the only thing I will say is, yes, that uh, my room priest Jones did say that in his report, and then he went on to give us a whole list of mitigations. So, you know, he kind of contradicted himself, really. But that, that's, the, that's the only thing I will come back to say on that. Thank you. Do you have any further comments on the Welsh language? Anthony Richard, please. Great. Um, yeah, I agree with uh, Councillor Rebecca Phillips, um, the chair of the committee. Um, how, Rihanna, you can claim that Neath Potalbert is not looking to increase English medium numbers. The school is going to be 770 pupils when the current total between the three uh, schools doesn't reach that. But, you know, it's, I, I just have, I would just like you to clarify that, please. I can only say again, as as, as Mr. Thomas has said many times, the schools, um, we the, the combination of those numbers, six six ten and 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 the nursery numbers, are the combination of the children currently in those three schools and the children who reside in the catchment area of those three schools. So those children exist in English medium schools. There's not one of those children that we've counted in that number who attend a Welsh medium school anywhere in Neath Patal, but Powys, Swansea or anywhere else. They are children currently in those English medium schools. So our proposal is not saying let's build a, a school for a thousand children and we'll find another 200 children. We'll take them out to Welsh medium and put them there. We are just saying these children exist in English medium education. And that's, again, is where those numbers come from. Is, is that OK, Joan? Yeah, I, I just can't understand why you should go for 770 pupils then. But I, I suppose we're not going to agree on that today. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so we're moving on now to general questions or statements. And the first um, councillor I'd like to call is Councillor Sonia Reynolds, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, some of my comments have already been made, thank you. But uh, I wanted first to, I, I have three um, questions, I think. One is, um, is there, you know, is there any perceived, you know, I, I live in a border community. Is there any perceived negativity about children crossing the border to attend schools if they feel it's closer or a better option for them? The second is um, if the proposal is turned down today, how long do we perceive that the pupils of Godra Greig School will need to stay in temporary accommodation? And the third is that, um, you know, and, and this is due to having spent a number of hours dealing with a quite tearful parent of an ASD child in my own community, who's been, who's having issues because there is no provision available for her child to go to because we haven't got enough. Um, that, you know, children with ASD will have to wait for a unit in the valley. Thank you. Th thanks, Sonia. If I, if I can deal with the, um, a proposed timeline in terms of if, if the decision either today or in the future you know, isn't we don't progress in terms of um, what will happen for God right? Because as I've already mentioned, the implications for thank you for that and, and that when are fundamentally different. Nothing will happen to them. They'll stay open and they'll they'll be as is. There'll be no capital investment at all. Certainly not in the near future. Um, it's it's difficult to give you um, an absolute because it, it depends obviously what members want to do. Um, as I said to you earlier, we will. If that decision is made, we'll need to go away. We'll need to come up with some um, advice and recommendations, guidance for for members. Um, so kind of a lot of it depends on, on what they do. If, if we make the assumption that members want us to look at providing a new school for Godric Reich, because that has been mooted during the, the during the consultation, then um, again, there's there's a couple of there's a couple of sort of roads we can go down. I'm, I would presume that members would want officers to explore with Welsh Government um, the possibility of them funding any new school in Godra Greig through the Sustainable Communities and Learning Fund, or 21st Century Schools as I know it, um, which of course takes longer than if we don't explore that option and we, and we try to fund it as a, as a council ourselves. Um, if we try to fund it ourselves, which would be the quicker route, obviously the more expensive route, um, if we were defending ourselves, I would anticipate pupils being in that new school uh, no sooner than summer term 2027. If we use Welsh Government funding, because that inevitably takes longer, then it'll be later than that. Can I come back on the, on the other two then? Um, in terms of children travelling over the borders for education, no, uh, there are, you know, we border lots of different counties all over the all over the thing uh, and it, for some children it would be nearer for them to attend a school out of county and as long as that school has got a, a room for them they're perfectly entitled to do so there's no there's no loss to us as such other than we would want our own schools to be valuable and to be full and to be you know for the for the money to be coming in to support our children in, in our in our education system um oh what was the other question oh asd provision yeah if this proposal falls and there isn't a plan b for um an asd provision in the swansea valley area we if we could have put one in one of the other schools we would have done it already because we're desperate for places as as, as you will know from from what you just said um so no what we will do is if this falls we will have to look for an, a suitable provision elsewhere in Neath but Talbot, um, and we're already taking some steps to to increase the provision, as you will know from a, a report I took last week in a different different committee. So, Councillor Rob Jones, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, been looking at the attendees that are in the meeting this afternoon, and I've worked out that it's roughly four or six members were the original members in this chamber that made the decision to invest in the 21st century SIPs program and subsequent to that decision about 12 years ago we've delivered as an authority YBB, Cumbronville, Carrickheer, Estlavera Secondary and Primary, Neath Abbey and the new Neath Abbey 
uh, Kevin Sison, Brodeer. We've gone through exactly the same process at every stage that those schools were debated, uh, uh, put out for closure, built uh, and delivered to the communities. And it's a very emotive subject. We are not alone in the council of doing that. Pembroke, Carmarthenshire, Bridgend and Swansea all face and have faced in the media um, the, the uh, difficulties of balancing, delivering good education with community need and aspirations. But the 21st Century Schools programme was supported by the whole council. Uh, and the reason why I emphasise this problem is that many members that are sitting in the chamber today in the two committees and online um, may not be aware of that history. We are the most successful council outside the capital city of Wales in delivering SIPs programmes and delivering new build 21st century schools. And this particular pro proposal would have been the first carbon neutral school to be built in this authority, something which I think is, is a great achievement. The report addresses all aspects of the consultation, the, the IIPs, uh, all the assessments, and comes to a positive recommendation, uh, which is listed on, on paragraph 173 within the report. But it took us two hours to get to the situation of the educational benefits and what benefits educationally will take place as a result of a 21st century school. I've said many times, it's not so much where you get your education, it's about the education you receive. And time and time again, this is about having buildings that are fit for purpose to deliver that education to a high standard with high quality IT and an environment that it's comfortable and easy to assimilate within the learning environment. You know, some of the schools that we've replaced, Dufferin, for example, which was a Victorian school well over 100 years old, uh, did still have outside toilets. And in the 21st century, that is not acceptable in any way, shape or form. But there's one question here that I think no one has really asked. It's been touched on. Um, Looking at uh, Godegraig School and the possible looking of a financial plan of rebuilding that school as it stands, you know, you're looking in the region of 15, 20 million pound. And one of the things that's not been mentioned this afternoon is the new swimming pool. We are going to be looking at somewhere in the region of 10 or 15 million pound. And we've already received reports in relation to the state of Pontedawi swimming pool and uh, its future. So the question that I have, uh, which will be directed to Mr. Thomas and, and the officers, bearing in mind this council okay. and those that are sitting in the cabinet now uh, previously, uh, there's never been a refusal either at this stage or in the planning stage, as Nicola has alluded to. My question is, simple question, I think a difficult answer. If, if the cabinet don't approve the officer's recommendation, what are the consequences for Ashtwen, Llanguk and Godedraig and the swimming pool going forward? Thank you. Um, I've already said um, in terms of Ashtwen and Llanguk, the, the consequences are, are not immediate. They will continue. They won't close, obviously. Um, they will continue. There will be any structural defects. They will be patched and mended. Uh, on the same basis that all schools in Neath Talbot are patched and mended. Currently, there's about £1.2 million in the capital programme at the moment to undertake all um, cap, uh, sort of uh, repairs and maintenance to our schools. A third of that immediately goes on um, statutory testing. So we're probably left with something like £750,000 every year. Our surveyors, who know our schools really well, will tell us which are the worst um, or the schools in most need, who needs a new boiler, who needs a new roof, who needs the new windows. And and schools can go many, many years without seeing any significant investment because it's just by dint of how much funding we actually have as a local authority available to us to fix schools. So that's the that's easy for the Frank Uke and after end um, answer. Codra Greg, of course, is, is, is more difficult. As I said earlier, we will need to take um, 
uh, advice back to, to members. Um, we'll need to take our time over that. We'll certainly probably need to um, let a three-month period lapse um, in terms of when a judicial review around a decision might be lodged. Um, but we'll need to give that advice to members. Um, if if the option for a new school is to be looked at, then we will presumably have to apply for um, capital funding from Welsh Government. That will take time. Business cases will have to be put together. Um, it's going to be very difficult to secure capital funding from Welsh Government for a new school in Gordogreig. And the reason I say that, I, I'm, not, I'm certainly not telling members that we, we won't, but I am telling you it's going to be very difficult because when we put the proposal together for the one we're talking about today, we looked at a range of options. I think it was 15 options in total. And we went back to Welsh Government and said, this is our preferred option. We discounted a new school for Godra Greig in that options appraisal. Welsh Government agreed with us. They said, what you, are consult what you want to consult on is actually the optimum um, uh, proposal. And we will give you money to, to build it should you go through the necessary process, which is, of course, what we're doing now. So it's going to be difficult to go back to them with a business case. And it isn't just about asking them for money. We have to satisfy a very stringent business case, treasury business case, five-case business model, which demonstrates that building a new school in Godregreig is the most strategic, economic, um, efficient use of public resource that there is. But if that's what, office, uh, if that's what members want us to do, that's what we will do. Um, how successful we'll be remains to be seen. But that is what you know we would do. And I've given you the time scales in terms of what I think would be um, the likely in that case. In terms of point of that was simple, it's, it's simple. Um, there is absolutely no way Welsh Government will give us any money for a, a replacement pool. Um, there is the, the possibility of securing some funding from Sport Wales. We will have to get our skates on if we were to do that. It's a maximum grant of £300,000. Um, we think the cost of a replacement pool is something like £13 million as it is. Obviously, in the future, it could be more expensive. Um, so there'll be no funding from any external source of that. So if members decide they wanted to build a new swimming pool, because that pool will close in two years' time at the longest, there's a, as part of the arrangements to keep the pool open at the moment, because I'm sure people will know it closed just before Christmas, um, consultants go in every six months to review the situation. So it could close sooner than two years. It will close in two years' time on health and safety grounds. A replacement pool will cost circa £13 million. And um, the maximum external grant that I'm aware of at the moment that we could point towards a new replacement pool is £300,000. The rest of it, if that's what members wanted to do to replace the pool, would be funded by you know, the, the local authority and therefore council taxpayers. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for your answer. So just to be clear, as it currently stands, it's a yes or no decision that the Cabinet haven't made. They make the recommendation either yes to support it or they uh, recommend that they won't support that recommendation. But then the current earmark business, five case business model goes forward with the 22 million. That money will not be redistributed in order to offset any of the re, uh, uh, renovations, refurbishments, remunerations, whatever you want to call it, in relation to the schools that are left. It won't be uh, supplementing any monies in relation to building a new pool, and God Greig will remain uh, an entity of undeterminable uh, uh, origins going forward. Just for clarity, that that's what we're facing if this recommendation is not approved today. So in terms of the swimming pool, um, if, if we don't approve, if we don't move forward today, then there will be no Welsh government funding for the replacement pool, and that much I can give um, assurance around. To the fourteen and a half or forty point seven million pounds the Welsh government have currently set aside for Neath Patalbot, as I said earlier, will still be available to Neath Patalbot. But to, to draw that money down from Welsh government, you have to put in a um, capital funding application through the five business case model. And that has to pass the, you know, the capital panels in Welsh Government's approval. So it isn't just about how you would like to spend that £14.7 million. You have to, to be able to draw it down, you have to, or we have to, make the case to say this is the best use of that £14.7 million. Um, so I can tell you now, officers will not be putting applications in, in that regard for Ashwen and Llanguk. We have to do something for Godra Greig. Um, I just don't see having ruled it out once. You know, I, 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 
completely transparent. I'm not saying there's no chance of securing capital funding for a new Godric Rig, but what I am saying it is highly unlikely. Hugh Jones, the chief finance officer this year, he's actually trained as one of the um, Treasury Five Case Business Model practitioners. So I don't know if you, who you want to say something about the the rigor that is involved in securing that funding. Good hospital pass for him. Uh, thanks, Andrew. I was trained a long time ago and I haven't done much in terms of five case business case modeling since. But just to confirm what you said, you need to satisfy a strategic case, an economic case, a commercial case, financial case, and a management case. So we would have to put something together to Welsh Government to satisfy all those five boxes, despite having already put something together, which says that that uh, proposal is not actually the best way forward. So that would be my um, personal opinion on that, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. And just for completeness, um, telling Welsh Government that um, you, what's changed is members won't don't, don't like the current proposal isn't grounds for them to change in their mind in terms of what satisfying that criteria uh, we, we will if we push that way we will do the best that we can to secure funding but i've got to be honest with members now it is my opinion highly unlikely that we'll be able to secure that funding okay thank you um assuming that councillor jones has mentioned the swimming pool um i've got councillor gold john that's indicated like to speak thank you yes chair thank you and it's just a point of clarity more than anything um paragraph 103 outlines the total backlog maintenance and accessibility accessibility costs for Altwen, Klangug and the swimming pool and that's 3.1 million and then paragraph 1 point, uh, 105 goes on to say that it's a notional cost of 1.9 million for the backlog for the both of the schools which leaves 1.2 million for the pool and I would just like to first clarify is it 1.2 million that's needed to bring the school uh, the pool back up to standard and if so, why can't we get that from Welsh Government as Swansea just bought Debenhams for like three million pound? I don't I don't think about Debenhams. The the costs uh, in terms of backlog maintenance are um, calculated uh, in the same way right across the local authority state. So we've got many, many buildings. Um, we have the same officer that does the surveys for all our schools. And that's important because then it's consistency. Um, those costs are uh, included within backlog maintenance in no way reflect what it would cost to actually re re um, improve the facilities up to a standard um, which would be required. And there's a variety of reasons for that. First of all, they um, they don't take into account any um, um, people disruption costs, for instance. So if we had to rewire a primary school, for instance, the pupils could, couldn't be in there while we'd rewire it if there was asbestos in a school. Uh, yeah, because you can. On, on this point, I'm just solely speaking about the pool. I'm not talking about the schools. So this is just so about this, the pool. It's, and it's, 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 gonna similar, it's, it's the same issue. But if it's closing well, in two years, it is, the impact is it's closed anyway. So if you're going to close it for six months now, for instance, to rewire it or whatever with an additional grant, then you're not having any negative impact. No, no. The the swimming pool in the most recent survey, which was undertaken six six months ago, something like that, has now concluded that it's and this was a, a an external consultant, so not not the officer in the local authority who does all the, the surveys. So they've they've done um, expert concrete consultants and um, M and E people. They've gone in there now and told us that it is beyond their economic, it's beyond its economic life. The work that we've undertaken recently in terms of putting props underneath the the learner pool and the um, spectator area is is only good for two years and then that propping system will not work any longer and it is beyond economic repair beyond its economic life and will have to be closed on health and safety grounds so the the cost that's in the report is a was is a report um a piece of work that was done some time ago but you're not really comparing apples and apples you're talking about um the cost of rewiring, the cost of replacing the windows, but that's not the issue in Ponte de Simple. It's much more fundamental in terms of the structure uh, of, of the fabric of the building, I'm afraid. Okay, noted, and I appreciate that explanation. It's thorough, thank you. Um, and just to clarify my point about Debenhams, the Welsh Government have gifted, granted, I should say, um, Swansea Council £2.9 million to buy the Debenhams building um, off the... Um, 
of of whoever owned the Debenhams, whoever is the landowner. And I was just wondering if we explored any avenues similar to them, because at the end of the day, they've just bought an empty retail unit, whereas we're going to keep a community facility. And I was just wondering if there's any sort of comparison or any sort of outreach that you've done to date about that. I'm sure Nicola is, is better because you t I think you're now talking about economic development strategy. So Nick is probably best to comment. I would imagine they've had um, funding from the Transforming Towns Initiative, um, and that is um, funding we've secured from the from Welsh Government to do our developments within the town centre and other um, areas across the county borough. So it is a different funding pot, and we've been successful to date in securing that funding. Um, but that funding is sort of distributed as uh, as uh, reasonably as possible across the area so um, that's why uh, Swansea have probably had that funding because they've been waiting for some time to secure um, Welsh Government funding and it is a city centre it's a very uh, prominent city centre property and it's probably critical to the um, reinvigoration of the city centre because it is um, struggling at the minute. Thank you Councillor Peter Rees please. Councillor Rees, you're on route. Right, thank you, Chair. I, I, I'm struggling to get online then. Um, can I say how interesting it's been to hear the different opinions this afternoon? I think we could all agree that the Welsh Government SIPs programme has been a tremendous boost to the education provision in East Port Talbot and thousands of children in East Port Talbot are now enjoying 21st century facilities. I would ask every member of this council to consider why you would want to deny the children of the Swansea Valley a 21st century facility. The, the children in, in uh, Swansea Valley, uh, in the Swansea Valley, deserve the same facilities that other children have had across the county better. We've heard, educationally, I haven't heard any argument against the educational argument for this school. The environmental arguments, I've, I've, I, I can understand, and I've considered, but as far as the actual provision of education for our children, and when I was the cabinet member, I wanted equality of education for all children in Neath Port Talbot. And the 21st century school programme helped us to provide partially that thing. I would love every area in Neath Port Talbot, every school in Neath Port Talbot to have this provision. Now, why would you want to deny those children in, in the Swansea Valley uh, that provision? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Rees. Councillor Ros Davis, please. Uh, some of the things that I was going to make a statement regarding have been answered, but I can't understand why Godric Wright School was in the plan in the first place because it already served three villages, namely Aslavera, Godrigraig and Kilmine Gwyn, that have no connection whatsoever with Pontadoa, and yet it's being called a community school. Aslavera, Godrigraig and Kilmine Gwyn will never be a part of the community of Pontadoa. Unfortunately, because of circumstances, the school had to close. I, I, I accept that, but they're going to still have to travel up to four and a half miles down to Pontadoa. That a school that's being shoehorned on a site that is not suitable, it's not in the right place for any school to be built, to be honest, with with a lack of infrastructure on the roads. Um, more pupils will have to be transported so much for a, a zero carbon school and yet you trans you want to transport a lot more children to the school in the first place and of course according to the um, 
education department, many, the majority of pupils are taken to school by cars. Well, now it's absolute chaos in the mornings and the afternoons in Ponte Dewe and the surrounding area. And especially imagining what extra chaos will be with the proposed up to 750 pupils in the school. It's it's going to be well, it's not going to be able to cope. I appreciate that we need to think about education, yes, but we need to think about people's children's safety and well-being before we ever find a school that is suitable. And of course, it is it, 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 it's absolutely impossible to be able to go to to the school in, in the mornings for other for for other ones that are using well, not to the school, actually to, to the uh, retail centre. It's it's absolute chaos. Well, anyway, much of the things that I was going to say has already been answered. And uh, by now, I'm sure that you have received the message loud and clear from Swansea Valley residents, parents, pupils, governors and staff of the three schools <coughs> with valid and not emotional reasons against this proposal. Councillor Davis, Councillor Anthony Richards, please. Um, it's really difficult following Councillor Ros Davis because she said everything basically that I wanted to say. I did want to come back to Councillor Peter Rees. Um, he just said about the educational impact, but where is the proof that standards and achievement has increased at a faster rate in 21st century schools than in other schools? We did raise that. You mentioned that we hadn't raised that. We did under that under that section. And if you remember, um, I quoted Estin reports. Um, just to reiterate as well um, that if I heard the Director of Education uh, correctly, there are other options for Godra Greig, um, but I believe um, that the director said that uh, no new school for them would happen before the summer of 2027, but I'm happy to be corrected on that. Um, the highway situation is all an unknown, and no means at the moment of having active travel routes, which would undermine many environmental sustainabil uh, sustainability uh, initiatives, although we're hoping that that would be the case, but we haven't done that all of that thorough work at the moment. Um, as I said, our schools are providing good education currently. Um, and it is clear to me that the plan will um, serve the link between education and the local community. It will lead to less educational provision and educational opportunities for, uh, for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, you know, who's going to pick up those children from school if they're unwell? halfway through the day. They may have a, the school bus to take them, but those ch um, parents who can't um, can't drive, for example, or can't pick their children up, who, who's who's picking them up halfway through the day um, if they fall ill? Um, and I feel that it will lead to a de deterioration in air quality, um, create danger on the roads as a result of an increase in traffic, cause a reduction in, in local green spaces, and having an extremely detri uh, detrimental effect on the, um, the Welsh language. Oh, uh, I'm happy, Chair, if you are to take an intervention. Sorry, Councillor Rees. Councillor Richard has already had that. You said there was, there was no chance of somebody coming back. He's already reiterated all those points previously, Chair. So why are we having to listen to it again? Yeah, he's just summing up, I think, um, in terms of the sections that we've discussed. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Richards. Diolch uh, fawr, Cadeirydd. Um, Councillor Rees, there are many other issues that cause me concern, uh, but to go back to where I began, we are absolutely honour-bound as councillors to trust the officers to make uh, factually correct statements in the reports, uh, which we have to take at face value. How, however, as I've said, and uh, for especially for Councillor Rees, I won't, I won't repeat them. Um, but I think, 
you know, we, we're coming to an end on this uh, debate now. Um, and I certainly have uh, made my decision now, and I would encourage other members to think very carefully about this decision. And let's remember uh, the needs and the um, comments that have been made by the local community. Diolch uh, Councillor Patterson, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've been listening um, acutely to the debate this afternoon, and I don't think, I've been looking around, I don't think there's another member in this chamber who's gone through this process as many times as I have because of the situation of schools in and around Sandfields West. Um, we've heard arguments regarding the loss of playing fields. I had exactly the same from my uh, constituents, my residents, and I was under a deluge of people uh, complaining about that. How was it worked out in process, in, in practice? Um, the flood in, you used to have to wear Wellington boot to walk on those playing fields as um, been treated. Uh, it's fine. The sports clubs, there are more people, more sports clubs using the fields than there were ever before. I do take on board that people can't just casually walk onto the school grounds like they used to be able to do. But personally, I'm quite happy and I was very concerned and Mr Thomas is there and you know, he knows how concerned I was about the things to do with the playing fields. However, it's worked out and I am completely happy with the way um, that the community are still able to access um, to the point that we, three councillors, recently invested money to provide a basketball pitch within the school grounds, which wasn't there before. So it's allowing things to develop and not just be a patch of grass. So I I take it back, Mr Thomas. <laughs> OK, um, with regards to pupil numbers, that, that's been mentioned as well. When we secure, we secure as county uh, councillors, and that's not ever to take away the fact that we are ward councillors and we owe our residents that attention, that we, we are there to see to their concerns. I certainly had lots of them given to me. Um, however, when we sit here, we sit to represent 140,000 people in the county borough. And as one of those councillors that takes I, I do take my responsibilities very seriously i i would agree with councillor reese um we should not be making decisions about people pupils um attainment or what what schools they go to on a postcode basis we have professional officers here and there's a whole bevy of line up there that have given us their professional opinions this afternoon and in the reports that they've spent hours and hours over. I tend to look at things and say, yes, OK, um, I have concerns. My residents have concerns. Does the does the concerns outweigh what what has been said here and Knowing how much the schools have impacted on my area, um, I would have initially uh, said yes, but I don't know. Hmm? So, um, routes to school, there were really some serious, terrible um, prophecies about uh, routes to school when opening uh, YBB. At the moment, I... I regularly look and there's there's no problems apart from, and I think um, the couple of uh, members here would agree that there's far too much of car use of cars um, in, in transporting children to school. But then we look at it and say they're coming from their home address, but maybe they're not coming from their home address. Maybe in these days, parents are delivering them to grandparents or childminders or whatever, and they may not be coming from the home address. So is it, is it really difficult to judge that? And my hat's off to officers. There's a lot of unknowns that you don't know, but you're dealing with them. Educational standards has been dealt with. 
And I do agree um, about us taking care of Welsh language, but I think uh, that um, this council has quite a good record on uh, what we are prepared to do for the Welsh language. I, I'm on the task and finish, and um, I would love to see more bilingual speakers, and hopefully I'll be having a new school, another new school, Ross Avon, um, very shortly in or around my ward. So taking in, in the round and taking on board the uh, results of the consultations, and I do take on board what people have said, and also taking on board my evidence of going through this process so many times now and hearing the same things, it's going to be um, Armageddon and it didn't turn out to be. So um, I'm putting my faith in the officers who have given their professional opinions and I shall be uh, using my vote accordingly. So I can't see any reason why we would turn down the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Clement Williams, please. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as a, as a, a councillor, we all have um, a collective responsibility as corporate parents. For me, that means that we give our children the best possible start in life that we can and the best possible start you can give to a child apart from the health and safety of that child to grow up in a safe, comfortable environment is to ensure that they have the best possible education that we can give them. That's what's always driven me when I've sat in these meetings and listened to arguments and debates about this issue. And hand on heart, seriously, hand on heart, I can say that I personally have made a decision that I feel is correct for the children. That's my personal decision. Our ALN kids in these areas are absolutely desperate for